A very warm good evening to one and all for this academic feast hosted by the Chennai Menopause Society. Uh, we have a lot of interesting programs as a part of this evening's uh, uh, academic program. Uh, I would like to ask Dr. Tamir Selvi to kickstart the program. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shobna. We would like to start by invocating invocation to the Almighty, and Dr. Shobna will render the prayer song. Over to you, Dr. Shobna. Thank you, Dr. Tamir Selvi. I'll start with a song on Lord Ganapati. Mm -hmm. Gananadane, Guna Bodane, Gananadane, Guna Bodane, Gajama Muka, Gatini Aya, Gananadane, Ina Yella, Peru. Thank you, Dr. Shobna. I invite you to be the MC for the proceedings. So now we will have the lighting of Kuttuvilakku. Chitrakala, can we have, play the video? Chitrakala. Now I would like to uh, request Dr. Tamir Selvi to give out the midlife prayer. Dr. Tamir Selvi is a senior consultant urogynecologist and pelvic floor surgeon attached to the Madras Medical Mission Hospital. And she is also uh, a member of many professional bodies. Her areas of interest are implementation of skills training in OBS and gynae, which she has done very successfully in the past year and before, and as you can see, she has edited several books and authored several topics and major textbooks. And she's also our course convener for M MRCOG part two and three, uh, and part three MRCOG examiner. Dr. Tamir Selvi for the midlife prayer. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shogna. We pray to God to give us the grace to accept the midlife physical changes and gently renew our strength. Guide our heart our mind and body to navigate the way and to trust in you to lead us safely through. We pray for midlife and mature women who cherish the fond moments of their life and also for those sitting in a doctor's office or who are in bed asking for the healing touch on this day. May all the menopausal women have the gift of joy, hope and good health. Thank you God for the promise of hope you hold out to all women and inspire us to give this gift of hope to others. 
thank you over to you uh, dr shobhna thank you thank you dr tamir selvi for that touching prayer which we all need uh, on our day to day basis now i would like to request our dynamic president of the chennai menopause society professor hepsiba kirmamani to give the welcome address though she needs no introduction i would like to say a few words she is also past president of the oxen gynae society of southern india and she has uh, published several papers and she is an avid teacher and she is also a phd guide in the uh, uh, savita university and she as you can see she has received the prestigious dr apj abdul kalam award lifetime achievement award teachers teacher award and uh, excellent specialist award from the tamil nadu medical council over to you madam to give the presidential address a very good evening to one and all respected guest of honor uh, dr behram rokya hanwa and dr hemant raj your members and participants on behalf of chennai menopause society i am extremely honored to welcome dr behram rokya hanwa and dr hemant raj Uh, Dr. Begum is a uh, dedicated gynecologist, and he is a head of the Department of Gynecology, National Institute of Cancer uh, Research and Hospital. I am. Uh, uh, thank you, Madam, for accepting our invitation and to release this webinar and newsletter. It is my immense pleasure to welcome uh, the guest of honor, my friend, the Sandian. Professor Hemant Raj, who is a dedicated oncosurgeon, past president Indian Society of Oncology and Indian Association of Surgical Oncologists, and I'm extremely happy to welcome our uh, eminent speakers, Dr. Ravi Jangidam, Dr. Sonal, Dr. Ayyappan. It gives me a privilege and happy to uh, welcome uh, the talented young gynec oncologist, Dr. Ambukani, who is going to moderate the panel. and all the eminent panelists dr sumana drachan dr kavita dr anita and uh, and i welcome each one of you and uh, this webinar is intended to understand the diagnostic dilemma and decision making in post menopause adenexial mass i'm sure at the end of this webinar will be enlightened with and it will provide definitely with the, what is the best approach for this condition in day to day practice and once again i welcome each one of you thank you madam we'll go on to the next program i would like to introduce the guests of honor for today's evening first i would like to introduce dr begum rukeya anwar as dr hepsiba introduced she is a professor in hod of gynae oncology and national institute Institute of Cancer Research and Hospital, Bangladesh. After doing her undergraduate in Bangladesh, she received specialist training in gynae oncology from our own Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai. She is also master trainer of colposcopy, and also uh, joint secretary of the Bangladesh Society of Colposcopy and Pathology. She is an associate of the Royal College of Obstetrician Gynecologists, London, and she has authored several textbooks. and we are very privileged to have you ma'am to address the delegates today please address our delegates now ma'am thank you very much am i audible yeah yeah yes ma'am respected guest of honor professor e hemant raj honorable president of chennai menopausal society dr n h priba secretary a tamil selvi and chair persons of the session Dr. P. K. Shanti and B. J. Lakshmi Sheshadri, and learned speakers, faculties, and moderators. Assalamu alaikum and very good afternoon to you all. Chennai Menopausal Society organized very important topic: diagnostic dilemmas and decision making in postmenopausal adnexial mass. I am I feel honored to join with you in this prestigious seminar. the adnexial mass in a postmenopausal patient poses an important diagnostic and management dilemma not only for primary care providers but also for gynecologist 
postmenopausal women are at a significantly increased risk of gynecological malignancy. Yet in population, the majority of technician masses are benign. Evolution and management of these lesions centers on the identification and identification of the malignancy, especially ovarian cancer, to avoid unnecessary surgery, unnecessary intervention. So optimal management of an asymptomatic adventional mass allows surveillance of women at low malignancy risk while triaging high risk and intermediate group for follow up. In case of high risk and intermediate group, most of the time surgery may be. Women with unilocular cysts on PVS and a normal CA125 level should be monitored by repeat TVS scan three to six month interval and serum CA125 level. However, if the mass is a complex mass but less than five centimeter with a normal CA125 level, we could follow up the case after four weeks interval. So, Flumark markers and imaging also help us in evaluation of adnexial masses. In postmenopausal women, for adnexial mass, highly suspicious for malignancy, a patient should be referred to gynecological oncologist for comprehensive surgical management. Sometimes we have patient with a history of total abdominal hysterectomy or removal of bilateral adnexial mass, but histopathology reveals a malignant lesion. At that time, two-step surgical approach could be done. In many, many places, there are no frozen section are not available. So in the advanced operation done elsewhere. So we could do surgical staging, proper surgical staging for optimal management. So the speakers will cover the topics, if anything left, that will be discussed in case discussion. So it is my recommendation that we should do very careful evaluation for admission mass to avoid unnecessary surgery. And where surgery is justified, we should go for comprehensive surgical staging in case of malignancy. We are busy in our life, but we have seniors, our mom, aunt, and elder sisters, it's our duty to bring them to physician for discussion of menopausal changes that could avoid future challenges. Even my mom, when assured by other physician, she became positive mentally and physically. So I would like to request you to um, bring your nearest and dearest one for health checkup at an interval of three to five years. Instead of giving gifts in the social occasion, a thorough health checkup would be a better gift for them. This thinking will surely bring a positive changes that will combat future challenges. I remember sweet memories of Chennai Sea Beach, fresh air, sunrise, and sunsets. So I wish I will join with you in an actual seminar. So I hope a happy and healthy, safe life for you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam, for that very nice message given to all of us, all the delegates. Now, uh, may I ask you, Madam, to release the uh, e-electronic newsletter of the Chennai Menopause Society for this month of August 2021, Madam. Just have to click that, Madam. We have an article on the current concepts in uh, ovarian cancer by uh, Dr. Anbukani and the IOTA guidelines on the description of uh, adnexal masses, uh, ovarian cysts. 
and also some uh, we have a health column talking about healthy diet as well as the importance of exercise for menopausal women in this uh, issue ma'am thank you so much thank you so much for releasing the newsletter wonderful thank you ma'am so now i would like to call upon dr hemant raj to give his address uh, dr hemant raj uh, needs no introduction to the audience of chennai he is an executive vice chairman of the cancer institute adr chennai and also the professor of surgical oncology he is past president of indian society of oncology and indian association of surgical oncology he has received lifetime achievement award from the tamil nadu mgr medical university he is a very a uh, busy surgeon as well as a teacher and he has authored several publications over to you sir good afternoon everybody am i audible yes sir okay now uh, i would uh, like to thank dr hepsiba for having uh, invited me to participate in today's uh, meeting it was very pleasant uh, hearing from her after a very long time uh, she is a couple of years my senior in stanley medical college and i was really happy to hear from her after a very long time now um, before i start um, am i audible now is it all right can i go ahead? yeah 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 audible yeah, okay. audible yeah yeah so i thought i'll uh, say tell a few of the statistics because i'm sure in the course of this meeting most of the things which uh, uh, we going to discuss i'll probably touch upon topics which we are not likely to discuss see ovary um, is a disease uh, unfortunately i feel uh, is a disease uh, comes uh, the patient comes quite bad dyspneic with a distended abdomen after the initial treatment she feels bright she feels that she has become very well and then she has the surgery done and she thinks uh, the whole world is you know uh, very good everything is fine for her unfortunately a year down the road in follow up she starts getting the first recurrence again we treat her and you know after that uh, depending on individual case it varies it takes a downhill crosse some people go on for 5 years plus and uh, things like that so i am quite uh, intrigued by this disease and of late my attention to gynecological cancers especially ovarian cancers um, is very much uh, there because i seem to be now concentrating more on ovarian cancers now uh, that is one of the reasons i felt very happy when dr hepsiba called me i remember in the 80s uh the among the top 5 cancers in women ovary was, did not find a place okay now if you see there ovary finds as the third most commonest cancer in women in chennai not only in chennai in entire tamil nadu it forms the third most commonest cancer cervix is number 2 if you see there other uh, gynecological cancer which is also going up is the endometrial cancer endometrial cancer has come within the top 5 in the rural in the urban area for the chennai city endometrium is 5 so these two cancers ovary and endometrium are on the rise which is uh, not a very great thing because our managing capacity of these two things is relatively more difficult and limited the age adjusted rate that is for every 100000 population adjusted to the age for chennai city it is 7.9 for tamil nadu the whole of tamil nadu we have a population based registry across the whole state covering 77 million of the population entire tamil nadu population we can give the incidence of ovarian cancer not only in each district in each taluk we can give the incidence across the whole state if you take the age adjusted rate is 5 per 100000 women so it has an urban bias probably due to the lifestyle and something linked along with the breast the breast is on the increase very much on the increase cervix is going down okay now since this is a post menopausal adnexal tumor talk today now the incidence of cancers in the registry data which we have uh, the population based registry less than 50 years it is 2.5% and more than 50 years it is 14% so the post menopausal obviously is very much more than the pre menopausal with reference to ovarian cancers the cumulative risk for a women a lifetime risk that is 0 to 
the cumulative risk for chennai for for the chennai city is 1 in 120 women 1 in 120 women stands a risk of getting a ovarian cancer whereas if you project it across the whole state where 50% are rural it is 1 in 201 if you see the trend of ovarian cancer which i alluded to in the beginning of my talk there is a disturbing trend if you, let us talk about chennai city where we have the data from 1984 in 1984 it was 3.9 per 100000 in 94 it became 4.6 in 2004 it became 5.6 in 2014 it became 7.9 so this is the statistics as far as chennai city goes if you see the whole of tamil nadu also it was 2012 in 2012 it is 4.7 in 2016 it is 5 per 100000 so these things are disturbing trends for us so we have to be well versed handling ovarian cancers more so postmenopausal cancers because that's incidence seems to be rising and the ovarian cancers in the urban areas are more because of the lifestyle issues finally i would like to end by telling most of us know the disease presence at a very advanced stage 70% of the disease that is 53% stage 3 and 17.2% stage 4 that is at presentation okay and uh, stage 1 is 14.2 and stage 2 is 3 12.6 is unknown i am sure the bulk of the unknown also will be in 3 or 4 so that is a very unfortunate situation where what we face and the stage ones are mostly detected in an asymptomatic women when they go for some other complaint and an incidental ultrasound or something picks up the tumor so this is a very important topic for all of us and uh, the women in the prime of her age when she matters most for her family taking care of the children and the family that is the age the disease comes in the 50s and 60s the prime age you know between 45 and 55 that age now that is where this disease comes so i am i am sure like my previous speaker who said uh, we should pay a lot of attention for this and uh, that is very important with this i would like to uh, stop my talk and i thank dr hepsiba and uh, all the other uh, speakers for joining today's program thank you very much thank you very much sir for giving us that current information on statistics which is alarming and shocking and it is uh, therefore fitting that we are going to address this issue in today's uh, academic session uh, hopefully at the end of the session we'll understand this pathology better and manage this better thank you sir once again uh, so now we'll move on to the scientific session so to chair the first part of the scientific session which involves three talks i would like to invite uh, dr shanti guna singh and dr vijayalakshmi seshadri uh chitrakala yeah dr shanti guna singh is a uh, very dear to all of us and uh, she is an a uh, voracious uh, reader and teacher past president of hobbs and gynie society of southern india and also for former director and superintendent of the institute of obstetrics and gynecology chennai from where i graduated and as you can see she has several awards including the recipient of dr el mudira traveling fellowship and uh, she is also the project served as a project director in the center of excellence for tubal microsurgery which is very very uh, busy and popular in kmc for 6 years she has done this she is executive committee member of our chennai menopause society and master trainer for adolescent health b monk and c monk and uh, our second chairperson dr vijay lakshmi seshadri is our active president of the oxy chitrakala can i have the next slide she is our present president of the oxy and gynae society of southern india and executive member a committee member of tn fog she is also a senior consultant very busy practitioner at the sundara medical foundation now she is also the quiz committee member of the ims so we also have an interesting quiz in today's program uh, over to you both to chair the first session of this evening program thank you dr shopana um and i uh, once again thank uh, 
Dr. Hepsipa for having given uh, both of us, given both of us the opportunity to chair this uh, wonderful session. And uh, can I have the first speaker, CB? The so we already know that the topic uh, for uh, uh, in focus is postmenopausal adnexal mass. And to talk about that, we have Dr. Revati Janaki Ram, who is the former director of IOG and uh, who was the vice president for South Zone uh, 2016. She is the active vice president of TNFOG 2021. She has been teaching UGs and PGs for the past 40 years. She's, uh, I'm also happy to state here that I was a student in uh, UG uh, and she has delivered many lectures uh, in national and international conferences and is a recipient of uh, innumerable awards, Lifetime Achievement Award, uh, Pride of Foxy Award, so on and so forth. So I invite uh, yeah. Professor Dr. Raivati Janikira to give a talk on adnexal, postmenopausal adnexal mass. And we know already uh, Dr. Begum uh, um, and Dr. Hemant Raj uh, told us about the importance of the postmenopausal adnexal mass, which is indeed difficult to diagnose and uh, treat too. And always in postmenopausal women, there is a higher incidence of malignancy. And uh, but then we also understand that uh, it doesn't mean that all adnexal masses in postmenopausal uh, women are malignant. Many of them are benign too. So we have, Madam, to clear us, uh, uh, clear our doubts about postmenopausal adnexal mass. Dr. Revati Janikiram, please. Thank you, Dr. Shanti, for the nice introduction. And good evening, everyone. Is my slide seen? No, not yet, madam. Oh, I have shared it, but I don't know what happened. I'll just close and come back again. Yeah. Okay. What is happening? One minute. I'll just close and then come back again. Okay. Chitra Kala? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah, can you help, madam? Uh, yes, ma'am. No, that's some um, thing. Here only, I will just do it. One minute. Uh, ma'am, please stop, share, and try once again, ma'am. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, ma'am. I'm just uh, closed it and then opening it. One minute. I kept it ready. Uh, sorry, what happened? Ma'am, can you please share again, ma'am? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just trying. One minute. Now, I think it's, it's okay now, okay? Yes? Ah, uh, yes, madam. Okay. Now, actually, when I talk about adnexal mass, of course, ovary, tube, rounding, and adjacent structures. But the focus is mainly on ovary. So, when you think there is an ovarian cyst, unlike what we think, it is quite common. It's not uncommon in a postmenopausal woman. Maybe compared to premenopausal women, it will be less. But still, we do see ovarian tumors, ovarian cysts in the postmenopausal women also. In postmenopausal women, adnexal mosses can have numerous etiologies. They can range from benign to melanoplastic, which origins which originate from a variety of organ systems. As you can see here, it can be either a non-gynecologic or a gynecological cause. Gynecologic, we all very well know benign conditions like simple cyst, hydrosalping, fibro ovarian cyst, tivoma, cyst adenoma, hematoma, pelvic abscess, cystic teratoma, uterine problems, ovarian torsion, PAD, and all. 
and of course malignant epithelial tumor sex spot tumor germ cell tumor and neurological cancer cervical cancer all these things can result in some unnatural swelling and of course we have to remember that there are some non gynecological both benign and malignant conditions which may also rarely present as an adnexal mass like an abscess irritable bowel syndrome uretic diverticulum or paratubal cyst colonic cancer retropectal sarcoma pancreatic cancer in whatever it is so any mass can come down and then may be may present as an adnexal mass now why we need and when do we find this ovarian cyst in postmenopausal women when they are subject to routine screening you may identify that that is number one point second thing is when you are investigating for a suspected pelvic mass incidentally you can find the adnexal mass also and moreover when you are doing an investigation for some other reason or for some other condition then incidentally you can find an ovarian mass now in that case what are we going to do how are we going to evaluate those days before usd was routinely available if you find a palpable ovary in a post menopausal woman everyone gets jittered and they think that it is a definitive indication for surgery immediately that was those days but now with ultrasound we find large number of ovarian cysts many may not need surgery further evaluation is very important because it has implications for both morbidity as well as mortality not only that it helps to avoid unnecessary surgery or invasive procedures or costly testing in the vast majority of patients in whom the simple cysts are benign and also helps in allocating the resource as well as referral to tertiary centers now the purpose of evaluation of an adnexal mass should fulfill these two questions should answer these two questions number one what is the most appropriate you identified an adnexal mass and it is suppose it is an ovarian cyst now what is the most appropriate treatment conservative or surgery if surgery laparoscopy or laparotomy and at the same time where should the management take place this in the gynecological gynecologist place or refer to a gynec oncologist now we should be very very clear when you identify an ovarian cyst in a postmenopausal woman to evaluate and judge the, and answer this questions the adnexal mass in a postmenopausal patient poses an important diagnostic and management dilemma for primary care providers as well as gynecologists postmenopausal women are of course at a significantly increased risk of gynec malignancy yet even in this population remember the majority of adnexal masses are benign evaluation and management of these lesion centers on the identification of malignancy especially ovarian cancer at the same time avoiding unnecessary intervention in patients with benign lesions of course with the help of tumor markers and imaging the evaluation becomes complete the diagnostic workup includes four important things a thorough history physical examination potential imaging and laboratory test let us say one by one a thorough history should be taken with specific attention to risk factors and protective factors risk factors family history of breast colon uterine or ovarian cancer hereditary ovarian cancer syndrome and protective factors parity and breastfeeding 50% it is a, the risk is reduced and combined use of combined oral contraceptive pills and the menopause status and also specifically observe the symptoms including those of endometriosis or malignancy so recently we in this pre paper session zonal conference one student one presenter presented a rare case of endometrioma in a postmenopausal woman okay so persistent abdominal distension change in appetite pelvic pain urinary tract each and every symptom should be given attention symptoms may be usually vague there may be persistent abdominal distension feeling full and loss of appetite pelvic or abdominal pain frequency or increase urgency in urination the challenge is to make the correct diagnosis as early as possible despite the non specific symptoms now there are various indices to triage women like the gopher symptom index now when a woman presents with an acute abdominal pain you have to remember there may be an ovarian cyst accident like torsion rupture hemorrhage okay other symptoms pertaining to non gynec causes mentioned earlier which i told you earlier related to the bowels or related to the genital urinary system genital urinary system so all these things must also be borne in mind whenever you ask and uh, look into those symptoms 
and obviously clinical examination includes BMI, breast, thyroid, and careful examination including abdominal and vaginal examination, and the presence of lymphadenopathy also should be assessed. Abdomen, of course, with parasites and palpable mass. Pelvic examination, of course, if it is a little enlarged over a small size enlargement, it may be a bit difficult by clinical examination because it has a low sensitivity for detection at next cell mass P. But still, a negative pelvic examination findings in a symptomatic woman should not deter further workup. You have to uh, do the workup and then search for a cause. Women who report abdominal, pelvic, abdominal or pelvic pain, increased abdominal size or protein, difficulty in eating, a rapid satiety that occurs more than 12 times per month in less than a year, they should be evaluated for ovarian cancer. So clinically, you come to some, to some extent, uh, you can there arrive at a conclusion. Of course, supported by imaging and uh, blood investigation. TVS is the best imaging modality for initial evaluation. Of course, you have got all these uh, advanced things like the color Doppler, 3D ultrasound, CT, MRI, all those things, but all these things are not recommended as an initial evaluation tool. Okay. If from the clinical picture, ultrasound finding and tumor markers, a malignant disease is suspected, of course, then you go for all these things, a CT or MRI, and the abdomen and pelvis should be arranged with onward referral to a gynecology multidisciplinary team. Ultrasound is well documented, you know, it is well documented that pelvic examination is, not, as I told you earlier, is not adequate in assessing the ovarian size. So for which definitely we need to go for ultrasound. And more so in a postmenopausal woman, especially if she is obese and she has got an additional enlarged uterus, it may become a bit difficult to make out the exact size of the ovarian cyst by simple pelvic examination alone. So in that case, definitely you have to depend upon ultrasound. A transvaginal ultrasound is a single most effective way of evaluating an ovarian cyst in a postmenopausal woman and that must be undertaken. And transabdominal ultrasound alone should not be taken. Maybe it can be combined with a vaginal ultrasound. TBS is the best. And tra transvaginal scanning, the morphological description and subjective assessment of the ultrasound features should be clearly documented to allow the calculation of the risk of malignancy. At this point, I would like to stress and just like the Chalda High TBS is not going to help at all. The transvaginal ultrasound scan should be performed using a multi frequency probe by trained sonologists with the expertise in gynecological imaging. That must be done, especially in a ovarian cyst in a postmenopausal woman. Now, as you said, ultrasound is the choice because it gives a, it has the ability to characterize the ovarian mass. But MRI may be used in addition to ultrasound in differentiation of benign versus malignant lesions, but of course, additional cost makes it to limit as a primary evaluation procedure. Of course, CT, PET, CT, and imaging, all these things are used for preoperative imaging of lesions which are suspicious of ovarian cancer to optimize the surgical planning, but they have a limited role in initial evaluation of the adnexal mass. And after doing these things, how are you going to predict the risk of malignancy? Morphologic indexing based on sonographically derived images, it is a relatively accurate and cost effective method to predict the risk of malignancy in an ovarian tumor. An effective system for predicting the risk of malignancy in ovarian tumors allows proper individualization of treatment, including either observation without operative intervention, laparoscopy, or exploratory laparotomy with debulking and also staging. Now, we go for CA125, it should not be used in isolation to determine the ovarian cancer with alone. It has to be combined with ultrasound at a clinical evaluation. And normal value doesn't exclude ovarian malignancy. It is not always in case, especially in mucinous tumors. If a cutoff, a cutoff of 30 units is used, sensitivity is 81% and specificity is 75%. But remember, caffeine, smoking, and hysterectomy, all these things may increase the level of CA125 a bit. PAD, fibroids, endometriosis, or benign lesions in which CA122 may increase. But when you take all the serum markers, CA125 should be the only tumor marker used for primary evaluation because it allows the risk of malignancy index of ovarian cysts in postmenopausal women to calculate it. Now, CA12211 should not be used in isolation to determine the it determine if the cyst is malignant. You have to go for the other test also. While a very high value may assist in reaching the diagnosis, normal value does not exclude ovarian cancer due to non-specific nature of the test. Now, other, all types of other tumor markers, 
the HC4, CDA, CAO90, all these things. As such, currently there is no evidence to support the routine clinical use of these markers as a primary evaluation technique in cases of postmenopausal ovarian cysts. Now coming to the what is RMI, the risk of malignancy index. It is the most widely used risk assessment for ovarian malignancy and it was developed in 1990, which uses CA125, menopausal status and the ultrasound findings. Okay, so uh, from this we calculate the RMI and it is very useful in assessing the risk in a postmenopausal woman. If it is between 25 to 200, there is a moderate risk and if it is more than 200, it is a high risk. So RMI more than 200 has a sensitivity of 87% and specificity of 97% for ovarian cancer and therefore it requires urgent assessment by a gynec oncologist. Now there are so many RMIs, RMI 1, 2, 3, but still RMI 1 is the most utilized and widely available and validated effective triaging system for women with suspected ovarian cancer. Now what is the role of aspiration of ovarian cysts in postmenopausal women to identify whether it is a malignancy or not? Aspiration should not be done, it is not recommended for the management of ovarian cysts or evaluation except for the purpose of symptom control in women with advanced malignancy who are unfit to undergo surgery or further intervention. Why no aspiration? Because number one, diagnostic cytological examination of ovarian cyst fluid is very poor in distinguishing between a benign or malignant tumor with sensitivity in most studies only around 25%. In addition, even when a benign cyst is aspirated, the procedure is not therapeutic. Approximately 25% of cysts in postmenopausal women will recur within one year of the procedure. Finally, aspiration of a malignant cell cyst may induce pillage and seeding of cancer cells into the peritoneal cavity, thereby adversely affecting the stage of prognosis. Stage and prognosis. There have been many cases of aspirated malignant mosses recurring along the leading track through which the aspiration was done. Furthermore, there is strong evidence that spillage from malignant cyst has an unfavorable impact on overall and disease-free survival rate. Now, the most important question is after making this RMI index, now we should clearly demarcate who is the person to handle this case. Benign and low probability of malignancy cases can be managed by gynecologists, either expected or surgical procedure. But we know very well that the primary management of ovarian cancer by a gynec oncologist definitely increases the survival rate. Currently, ACOG says that when there is ascites, evidence of metastasis, elevated score on a formal risk assessment, for postmenopausal patient with elevated CA125, fixed or nodular pelvic mass, all these things, they should be referred to a gynec oncologist. Now, just as you see, one case, 54 year old postmenopausal woman who presented with a three day history of left lower quadrant pain. But all this examination, see, everything showed that she had uh, some acute diverticulitis. Okay? So she was treated with antibiotics and she was relieved of the entire symptom. But incidentally, at that time, the transvaginal sonography confirmed the presence of a 4 centimeter simple left ovarian system. Now, what are we going to do? Are we going to worry about it, evaluate further? Now, in this case, you can use what you have uh, learned till now. This four centimeter simple cyst how we are going to manage. So they are going to conclude the clinical bottom line is that simple ovarian cysts can develop as part of the normal menstrual cycle, of course, three menstrually. And even though they are more common pre-menopausally, but in postmenopausal women also, and out one out of five postmenopausal women, it can be seen simple ovarian cyst. And postmenopausal women with an asymptomatic cyst, less than five centimeter, normal CA 125, RMA less than 200 can be followed conservatively with repeat imaging at four to six months. And they have been, if they are, they are detected in a one out of five postmenopausal women. Now, simple ovarian cysts are typically not cancerous in women of any age. Now, see one thing, one centimeter or like that, absolutely you cannot worry about it at all. It is not malignancy at all. You can just write off. And up to five centimeters, simple ovarian cysts with a specific characters, then definitely you can go for follow up. And to make it short, postmenopausal ovarian cysts, you go for the three important things, TVS, RMI, CA125. And if the RMI is less than 200 and this is asymptomatic, simple cyst, less than 5 cm, unilocular, unilateral, go for a conservative management, give her assurance, repeat ultrasound on CA125 at 4 to 6 months interval. If it regresses, that's all you can drop her. If it is going to increase in size, of course, you put her into the 
uh, other end for consider surgery for bilateral usually self hysterectomy preferably bilateral because the chances are there for the other side ovary also now if the rmi is more than 200 of course you go to you have to go for further evaluation ct abdomen and pelvis and refer her to a gynae oncologist who can decide whether to do laparotomy or laparoscopy now all other ultrasound scoring and the surgical management of course the other two speakers are going to discuss that's why i just touched upon and then left it thank you very much much madam for your uh, excellent talk on evaluation of adnexal mass you have nicely um, stressed on the need for a proper history taking uh, before clinical examination and also about the importance of transvaginal sonography and probably following iota classification i mean um, It will really help us to characterize, uh, I mean, uh, OB, I mean, adnexal lesions to a certain extent, and also the importance of CA one twenty five and RMI, and more than that, uh, working along with uh, gynae oncologists. So, as gynecologists, we should know our limits too, and know when to refer to uh, gynae oncologists for uh, better uh, patient uh, survival. Thank you very much, madam. Now I hand over uh, the podium to my co-chairperson, Dr. Vijay Lakshmi. Thank you, Shanti. And uh, first, I thank Dr. Hepsiba for having given me this opportunity. And uh, it was really very nice to have heard the introductory um, speeches by our guests of honor and a very crisp and uh, to the point. a uh, presentation by uh, dr revathi janakiram uh, so we move on to uh, one more interesting talk on the ultrasound diagnosis by uh, and also the risk assessment of the malignancy in the postmenopausal adnexal mass and to tell us all about it we have dr sonal panchal who is a consultant at the dr nagari institute for infertility and ivf is also a professor at Jaboronic International University and is a faculty at the Ian Donald School of Ultrasound at Dubai is a national academic director in India as well and has a pioneering research work in infertility and polycystic ovaries related ultrasound has presented and published papers in several conferences and journals and has contributed immensely to books as well she is also a peer reviewer for several journals so over to you dr sonal panchal to uh, know more about the ultrasound risk assessment for the postmenopausal adnexal mass thank you very much is is am i audible yeah yeah yes madam thank you very much ma'am for those uh, very kind words and is is my presentation visible not it not it not it no i actually did a share screen okay okay is it visible now yes. yeah yeah so thank you very much ma'am for those very kind words and thank you very much to all the organizing people for uh, giving me this opportunity to talk to you all uh, many of the old friends also once again and um, yeah i do agree this is a very very useful uh, subject and probably all of us whether we are doing oncology or not whether we are doing a gynec practice or just an obstetric practice this is a very very important subject we all must at least if not master we must have a proper know how about how to manage this patients talking about adnexal masses in the postmenopausal women the role of ultrasound and the risk assessment of course a lot has been discussed by madam revathi but i will chiefly concentrate on ultrasound and before i start i would uh, uh, want to mention this that when you are talking about ultrasound though alta is very very important alta is not absolutely everything that we are going to rely on because there are a lot of ultrasound signs there are a lot of uh, doppler findings 3d findings which are very very suggestive of malignancy and will help us diagnose malignancy 
much much earlier than even uh, i mean i would i would like to quote this one or two uh, incidences before i actually start the presentation um, we have been able to diagnose uh, malignancies in ovaries as small as 3 cc in volume just based on 3d and 3d power dopplers and i'm going to tell you about those signs so it's very important that of course iota is an important base but it is very important to look apart from i mean look outside iota also when you're doing your ultrasound postmenopausal women are at a significantly increased risk of gynecological malignancies with a lifetime risk of ovarian cancer or as high as about 1 in in 70 i heard it is about 1 in 120 cumulative risk in in chennai and tamil nadu and that was really shocking Therefore, the adnexal mass in a postmenopausal patient poses an important diagnostic and management dilemma. But as was rightly mentioned earlier, not all uh, postmenopausal ovarian masses or adnexal masses are malignancies. We do commonly see serous cyst adenomas, paratubular and paraovarian cysts, endometriomas. Mucinous cyst adenomas, hydrosalpings, peritoneal cysts, and a lot many other, other lesions. But still, we are always feared of ovarian malignancy, more because its symptoms do not become evident till the tumor invades the surrounding structures or the metastasis or ascites develops. And therefore, 65% of the women with ovarian cancer have, when they are diagnosed, they already have stage three or four disease. And therefore, the five-year survival rate is only 20 to 30%. But it's very important to understand that if we can diagnose these diseases, this disease as early as stage one, we can improve the survival to 90%. That means we must have some diagnostic methods, some screening methods, which will help us diagnose ovarian cancers much earlier than stage two, three, or four. Anatomic location of the ovaries is not easily uh, amenable to direct inspection and ovarian cancers lack any defined precursor lesion. And these are the reasons why we often miss early diagnosis. Moreover, even if we say we can do a screening, even then, even then, the time taken by the disease to disseminate from the localized to ovary to outside is not clear. You, you may see some patients in whom the ovarian malic the ovary was absolutely normal today and within three months you see a quite quite a, a, a big mass. And in some patients for two, three years, there is no growth of the lesion. So it is very difficult to plan the screening processes and therefore the ovarian malignancies is feared of by majority of the women especially when they, they are told that they have some mass in the ovaries. And the same is true for the consultants and the gynec uh, uh, gynecologists also. It is therefore a very high specificity that is required if at all we are planning screening tests and it should be, the specificity must be as high as 99.6% um, to achieve a positive predictive rate of 10%. This is a very high sensitivity and specificity. And therefore, there are different models which have been tried. And um, there are some people who use the, uh, the, the biochemical markers first and then ultrasound. There's some who use ultrasound first and then biochemical markers, but it is the multimodal screening which is most useful as already again discussed by um, Revati Madam. Tumor markers and imaging can help in early diagnosis and evaluation of the adenexal mass in the postmenopausal women, but transvaginal ultrasound has also long been considered the imaging modality of choice for the evaluation of adnexal masses. But very interestingly, if we see, if, if we read this statement, it clearly says that postmenopausal women from the general population with elevated CA125 but normal ovarian morphology on ultrasound during the median follow-up of six to eight years had cumulative risk of ovarian cancer of only 0.15 to 0.22 percent. Whereas those patients who had high CA125 and abnormal ovarian morphology 
the risk was as high as 24%. That means adding ultrasound does significantly help us diagnose uh, uh, the, the ovarian cancers much earlier. The ultrasound is therefore really important and more reliable. What are we talking about when we're talking about ultrasound? Of course, when you're talking about ultrasound, the transvaginal scan, as has been mentioned earlier in the earlier presentation, is the math, is the root of choice for the scan. But for all the ovarian cancers, it's very, very important to combine this with the transabdominal scan also, because many trans many ovarian cancers, they do present a little late as such as a mask, but their secondaries or ascites might appear even earlier. And therefore, it just has to be a combination of a transabdominal and transvaginal scan. Moreover, uh, if you're talking about the different ultrasound modalities, apart from the B-mode ultrasound, Doppler, 3D ultrasound, 3D power Doppler are very, very important. We have to combine this with, with much more systematized and simplified methods for the analysis of our findings like IOTA consensus at next model and of course the pattern recognition. Talking about ultrasound then, coming, coming to the core ultrasound itself, what are the basic things that we are going to look at? We will look at the measurements, the morphology and the vascularity. When we are talking about the measurements, there are certain measurements which are important, of course, in a postmenopausal woman and ovary of more than 10 cc in volume, cyst with uh, wall thickness of more than three millimeters, septa with thickness of more than three millimeters, uh, uh, solid um, uh, projections of larger than one centimeter, papillaries of more than three in number. Papillarities are the lesions which are solid projections but are more than three millimeters in height, less than seven millimeters, up to seven millimeters usually, but yes, till one centimeters, you can still call it a papillarity. Beyond that, it's always a solid projection. So these are certain measurements that we usually come keep in mind. The size of the largest solid component is one of the most sensitive parameters for the diagnosis of malignancy. That means even if you are seeing a unilocular lesion, and even if there are no septa, there's just one solid projection. But if it is large, then the risk of malignancy is much much higher. A very important, a very important and a very key message, a very, uh, uh, you know, helping key message to differentiate between benign and malignant or to suspect malignancy is, by, is given by Professor Lee Valentine. And she's mentioned in one of her papers that irregularity of shape and ecogenicity, that means heterogeneous ecogenicity, are the most reliable signs of malignancy. That means if you see irregular margins of the solid components, if you see irregular margins of the cystic walls, if you see heterogeneous ecogenicity, that is when you should suspect malignancy and if the sensitivity of it is as high as 85%, specificity 94% for the diagnosis of malignancy. Now, if we are talking about the measurements, so we have talked about the measurements we have talked about, now we, we move to morphology. In morphology, we have talked about irregular margins and heterogeneous ecogenicity. If you are looking at a unilocular cyst in the postmenopausal women, up to 10 centimeters in size, a size may be found in 5 to 17% of the menopausal population with less than 1% risk of malignancy and should be followed up with ultrasound imaging in, uh, for, for four to six months and resolution occurs in about two thirds. If the resolution does not occur in spite of appearing very simple, still it requires further investigation and at times even surgery. So that is about the unilocular cyst in a postmenopausal woman. Why I am taking this separately is that the presentation of benign as well as malignant lesions in the postmenopausal women is a little different than what you find in the menopause in, in the premenopausal women. And therefore, I repeat, we cannot apply IOTA blindly onto that. We have to use IOTA, but we also have to use other observations or of ultrasound, including the Doppler's 3D power Doppler's. 
if there are papillary projections this with one or few one of one or a few small papillary projections that are less than 3 mm are likely to be benign however if the papillary projections of any size involve greater than 50% of the inner walls inner cyst wall um, or are four or more in number the malignancy is more likely if you are seeing septae and locules so because we are talking of morphology multiseptated cysts without solid elements are associated with low risk of malignancy, whereas borderline mucinous ovarian tumors are generally at least 10 centimeters and have at least 10 locules. So if there are locules, if there are septae, but there are no solid projections, the chances of malignancy is a little lesser. But even if the solid projections are not present, the number of locules are more than 10, the chances of malignancy are quite high. Multilocular, and solid or cystic masses, of course, when it comes to solid and cystic masses, the risk of malignancy is significantly, significantly high. And I would like to point out here that instead of going for 10 cc and to wait till the lesion uh, uh, grows to that size, you must pick up malignancies earlier. As Madam has rightly mentioned, it is not just a single measurement of CA125, which is uh, important. Even if the CA125 is normal, you do a follow-up after six weeks. For, and if this level is rising, this is a sign of malignancy in a postmenopausal pain. For the solid tumors, of course, fibrothecomas are quite common, but and, and they usually present as hypoechoic mass with a caustic shadowing. But whenever there are solid lesions, Doppler is important and the risk of malignancy is significantly, significantly higher. So this is all about pattern recognition and morphology. Familiarity with this classic appearance is why a pattern recognition can improve the triage into almost certainly a benign, uh, with, almost, with, with almost certainty for all the benign category. But, but it is also important to use Doppler for the same as I've been mentioning. It has been very clearly and very nicely mentioned in one of uh, his studies, Professor Kuriak. He has shown that if you are seeing vascularity in the solid projections or in the septa, and if the resistance index of these vessels is less than 0.41, this is one of the earliest signs that you can diagnose malignancy. That means if you are seeing a complex lesion with the vascularity showing an RI of less than 0.41, you must suspect malignancy, no matter what is the morphology otherwise, <clears throat> and uh, uh, no matter what is the age. It is, uh, it is increased vascularity, which is strongly suggestive of malignancy, but presence or absence of malignancy or high resistance flow does not exclude the possibility of malignancy. Why? Because if I am seeing a post-menopausal women, the resistance in the vessels in the mass lesion is going to be less than what it is in the normal vessels. But in the normal vessels, in the postmenopausal women, the RI otherwise is also very high. And therefore, in spite of malignancy, it may not come to as low as 0.4. So low resistance confirms malignancy, but high resistance does not exclude. Moreover, there will be also necrotic areas in the lesion where there will be no vascularity. So yes, remember vascularity is important, but it is not the sign of malignancy. So with all this, yes, we know that there are several signs, morphology measurements, which will tell us about the, uh, the presence of malignancy to put everything in a little more systematized approach the IOTA came in. I'm not describing IOTA in detail because as I told you, it's already there in your booklet. And if I take on IOTA, it will take at least one and a half hours to discuss IOTA in detail. But in IOTA, there are simple descriptors which are based on the pattern recognition that we have just described and we are going to describe a little more. There are simple rules, there are logistic regression, but on top of all is the expert opinion. If we are talking of simple descriptors, I mean, well, what does the simple descriptor say? I'm not going to go into the entire thing. If I'm talking of simple descriptor, what will it tell me? Okay, there is a cystic lesion, thin wall, no internal ecotonicities, no solid projection, no septa. It is a simple cyst. If I'm seeing a cystic lesion, which has no solid projections, has a thick wall, but has typical hemorrhagic ecogenicities, fishnet pattern, etc., lace-like pattern, 
it is a hemorrhage excess. If I'm seeing a lesion with ground glass echogenicity, possibly it is, it is a, an endometrium. Or I'm seeing a, a solid and a cystic lesion with a posterior shadowing or a caustic shadowing, it is more likely to be a dermoid and so on. So that is, that is about simple descriptors. There are many such, and there's a simple descriptor. So if, if your lesion fits into the ultrasound image, fits into any of this, yes, your diagnosis is much more easier. But if it doesn't, then we use simple rules. And what are the simple rules? There are five rules. Unilocular tumor, solid projection, if at all present, less than seven millimeter, a caustic shadowing, smooth contour, and no blood flow, which tells me this lesion is a benign tumor. If instead I am seeing the features which are shown here in this table, irregular solid tumor. When I say solid tumor, any tumor according to aorta, even if it is cystic, but has a solid component is called a solid tumor. So irregular solid tumor, ascites, at least four papillary projections, irregular multicystic lesion, and that means multiple septa and, and locules with irregular walls and strong blood flow indicates malignancy. If you go into Elta, any one benign sign is present, the, the mass is benign, any one malignant sign is present, the mass is malignant, but if both are present, you can, one of both are present or two of both are present, you can not say it is benign or malignant. A unilocular or a multilocular cyst with, uh, with solid components or a predominantly solid, when, when the solid component is more than 80%, it is a predominant solid. These are the lesions which are more likely to be either borderline or uh, malignant. And these are the simple descriptors which have helped us to differentiate the benign from malignant. And it has grossly helped in decreasing the number of unwanted surgeries in the countries where IOTA is used. As I told you, if you have one benign and one malignant component or a mix of two, that is when your simple rules, simple descriptors are not going to help. That is where you need a logistic regression. And it is on this logistic regression that this IOTA at next model is made of. It has, it has been made so easy, not only easy, it has also been made very informative and easily applicable, easily usable by anybody because it's also available on your mobile phones. So what you do is once you have done your scan, you just fill up those boxes, age of the patient, oncology center, whether it will, the, the assessment is done in the oncology center or, it, or, or it's done in a primary center, maximal diameter of the lesion, maximal diameter of the solid part, Number of populations, acoustic shadowing, whether present or not, ascites and serum a, uh, uh, CA125. And once you fill up this, then, and, and you click enter, you say submit or you say calculate, that's when you get a graph like this. And what does this graph show? This graph has all the different scenarios. What is the chance of benign tumor? What is the risk of malignancy? What is the risk of borderline tumor? What is the uh, risk of stage one tumor? What is the risk of stage two to four malignancy? Or what is the race stage of, what is the risk of metastasis? So for any one particular tumor, it tells you, okay, I mean, the, the taller the bar tells you this is more, most likely. So for example, if there was a particular lesion, for that particular lesion, if this is the result, then, the chance of benign tumor is maximum and the chance of metastasis is zero. And the chance of uh, risk of malignancy is about 37%. So it gives exactly the, the, the picture, the picture becomes very clear as to what is likely and what should be a further line of treatment. So that is how Ad Alta at Next Model have been very, has been very, very useful in differentiating benign and malignant, especially for the beginners. Yes, of course, I do agree. And even IOTA says it is the expert opinion, which is on the top list and it can not be beaten by anybody. But yes, this makes the things simple. Despite all the malignancy were correctly identified by both 2D and 3D imaging, the specificity significantly increases with 3D, and, uh, with 3D power Doppler. Why is that so? 3D not only helps you better understanding of the irregularity of the uh, walls or irregularity of the shape. It gives you better idea about the globular vascularity 
So the extent of vascularity, not just the extent of vascularity, you can actually identify individual vessel. You can see whether the vessel is, is uh, 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 symmetrical in diameter or has irregularities. What are the, how many are the branches? Is there a tertiary branching pattern present? And all these are the features of 3D ultrasound, which help you diagnose malignancy. The malignancy, uh, early diagnosis of malignancies that I was talking about with you will show the signs, microaneurysms, arteriovenous shunts, tumorous lakes, elongation, coiling, and diacotomous branching pattern and asymmetrical caliber. And these are very, very important points that you can find out in tumors as small as less than one centimeter in size also. Remember, therefore, if you see a cystic lesion, simple looking cystic lesion also in a postmenopausal woman, which does not regress for four to six weeks at first and maximum for three to four months, that's when you must do a, 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 a 3D power Doppler. And many a times you will find a typical uh, malignant pattern. So it's very important to do a proper, uh, I mean, take a proper uh, expert opinion wherever there is a doubt. And that is what is going to help us the most. One more last thing is you can do a contrast enhanced ultrasound and that will show the vascular pattern much, much better, which will give you idea about the malignancy. Of course, the management part is, uh, uh, is helped by giving the reports as gyrates uh, stages. And we know that when we find that the, on ultrasound that the uh, lesion is purely is absolutely normal and there's no lesion or the ovary is normal you say uh, uh, guides one when you see adnexal masses which are surely benign you say uh, guides two then you have lesions where you think that of course these are not probably malignant not probably i'm not saying surely not probably malignant but they still need to be taken care of surgically that's when guides three Guided four and guided five are high risk of malignancy, and that is where oncological uh, opinion is important. So to, to summarize, TVS is the most important primary investigations to suspect malignancy in most postmenopausal women, but transabdominal scan is also required. Different strategies are used to simplify the differentiation of benign and malignant. IOTAD next model, guide the guided system, etc., are all here to help us standardize and simplify the uh, description as well as the, the uh, differential diagnosis of these lesions. Though IOTA simple rules and descriptors and IOTA at next model are very useful for the beginners to confidently assess the risk of malignancy for a particular lesion. It is the pattern recognition, expert opinion, and the use of Doppler and 3D and 4D power Doppler, which have proved equally or maybe even more useful in experienced hands. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sonal. That Thank was you. A, yeah, that was a wonderful presentation. Um, straight hit on the all the ultrasound features of the postmenopausal adnexal masses. How do we differentiate? How do we go about uh, giving a risk assessment score? And then uh, also you touched upon the IOTA. Now, uh, we know uh, ultrasound forms a very, very basic tool for the assessment of the ovarian uh, masses or adnexal masses, especially in the postmenopausal. But of course, now in an era of uh, CT and uh, MRA and uh, uh, all these, of course, your topic was on ultrasound. But I'm sure people are also worried about all these things and to counter check with ultrasound. So later, maybe after all the three discussions, you can just clarify as to why ultrasound takes an upper hand over the uh, diagnostic uh, dilemmas, which can happen because of the other radio imaging uh, modalities. Yes. So, if, if I can just add one sentence, ma'am, there is that ultrasound is a modality which is most easily available one. It is um, the pr considered the primary modality because it can uh, look at the ovary much more closer in spite of using CT, MRI, and PET, we still get sometimes half-hearted information, and especially using Doppler and uh, being able to do dynamic examination. That is the reason why ultrasound is on the top of the list. As a primary investigation, of course, whenever malignancy is suspected, all the rest of the investigations are to be followed up, but primary is still ultrasound. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.
so now we move on having diagnosed now it's a job to see who can manage and how to manage and we always look towards the um onco onco surgeons or gynec oncologists so here we have dr ayyappan uh, who is a visiting consultant surgeon to uh, onco surgeon to many many institutions in chennai including uh, our institution so uh, we are so used to calling him and then uh, also learning from him as he operates so over to you dr ayyappan who is also the director of the Madras uh, Cancer Care Foundation. And uh, I'm sure he, we will have lots of things to learn from him. So over to you, Dr. Ayyappan, for the management of postmenopausal and neck cell masses. Thank you, madam. Thank you for that excellent introduction. First, I'd like to thank the organizing committee, especially Professor Hepstiba, for giving me this excellent opportunity. Right from the beginning, we have been hearing that the incidence of the adnexal masses in postmenopausal ladies is somewhere about 3 to 14 percent. Yes, why is it so much spoken about the adnexal mass and why is it so much of importance for that? In postmenopausal lady, as it has been told very clearly, the chance of malignancy is very high. Now, anything, whatever you talk about, you spoke about now, whether it's evaluation or if it is radiological investigation, whatever it is, the prime idea is to try and find out whether it's a malignancy or not. Why? The reason being, if malignancy is caught in an early stage, the survival of these patients is far superior when it is in a third or a fourth stage. Ironically, most of the time, the ovarian cancers are caught in a third or fourth stage wherein the survival, the prognosis of these patients is very poor. My speakers, the previous speakers have excellently spoken about the evaluation, but I like to, as an oncologist, many times we see certain points have been missed out by not by the routine speakers, but when it comes to the practitioners. I would like to enumerate some of the most important things which are routinely, in as because I come to hear that a lot of students are also there for hearing to this. I want to specifically tell about certain points. When you do a good physical examination, it was spoken about by Revati Madam that nodal station needs to be examined. It is very important that you examine the supraclavicular area, the inguinal nodes, and the axillary nodes also. The next thing is bilateral breast examination. As always, the gynecologist you examine the per vaginal examination. It's very important that you go for a per rectal examination also. You'll be able to pick up a lot of points by doing a rectal examination, wherein you can pick up some pelvic deposits, which can give you an excellent idea of what you are handling. Madam, she mentioned about history taking. Yes, family history and personal history. Family history, you need to talk about breast ovary, endometrium, and colonic malignancy. Very important is about eliciting the personal history. Many a time what happens is the patient would have had a problem in her breast about 10 or 15 years before. The patient will forget and they'll think it is not important to tell about this particular history. We need to elicit and find out whether any surgery has been done on the breast, whether any treatment has been given. So then the patient will slowly tell, yes, some years back some surgery was done. So eliciting of this history is very important because while managing a patient who has a malignancy already, the management is entirely different in those patients when compared to that of a general population who has the same finding on evaluation. As Madam, as previous speaker has told you, know, while evaluating, if on evaluation you find out whether this, there is a suspicious mass, if just suspicious of highly suspicious of malignancy, then you go for the other investigations by the like the uh, CT scan or the MRI. And we also need to have a clear cut idea. Some of the time, the primary, that is the adnexal mass, may not show clear cut features of malignancy. The index may not be so high as we always want to be, but it may show some other findings. As I was told about the previous speaker, ascites can be there, peritoneal deposits can be there, enlarged lymph nodes can be there, or you can also have omental deposits can be there, omental caking can be there. All these things also need to give us an idea that what we are handling is a malignancy and investigation needs to be done accordingly. A very common investigation which will be immediately done is going to be a image-guided biopsy of those nodules. 
or if it's not possible because of the placement of the nodules or the size of the nodule, then you go for a laparoscopic guided biopsy of these nodules. I brought in the slide, especially like the previous two speakers, very important slide because many a time, because of the presentation, the symptom may not be connected anywhere to that of the gynecological symptom, like the routine pervaginal bleeding, but the patient might present only with that of the abdominal symptoms, a constitutional symptoms, abdominal bloating, or the patient will come out with the constipation, or that of urological symptoms, like that of, because of the pressure of the pelvic mass, patient might have urgency of urination. Sometimes the pelvic patient, very early the patient comes out with that of the yeah, pelvic pain. So we need to keep in mind about the symptoms, because the symptomatology, Though if it is going to be low risk case or intermediate risk, if the patient has got symptoms, the patient needs to be handled accordingly. Likewise, as I mentioned, the mutation, that is a BRCA1, BRCA2, and the Lynch syndrome, that is a hereditary non polyposis colon cancer syndrome, if the patients have anything connected with this, then the chances of these patients developing malignancy the ovary is very high. That's why I told you, about the personal history and the family history, this plays a very important role. Why? Because many a time, we may not, the patient may not come to you and say that I have a BRCA gene, but the patient's family history matters a lot because if the patient has a family history, there are chances that the patient can be one of the two or one of the three, so that we need to be cautious of these things. How do you manage these patients? The management, many a time, in anything you take, management depends on the type of the mass and the level of suspicion. And it is also many a time a clinical judgment of what will be the right thing for this patient. And we always call that as an intuition, but it's a clinical judgment, which basically is on the previous cases, you try to take a judgment of these patients. And the very important thing is the characteristics of the patient, the patient's well-being, the patient's general condition, the patient's understanding, the patient wishes, and very importantly, how far is the patient going to be uh, compliant with that of the management, whichever you're going to tell the patient. And very important, it has been very well clearly shown beyond what, by very many number of studies that the patient, where the patient is managed, by whom the patient is managed, whether the patient is being managed by a trained surgeon, a trained oncologist, a trained gynec oncologist matters a lot. And whether the patient is being handled in a center where it is equipped with that of the multidisciplinary tumor board. Because when you handle the patient with a multidisciplinary tumor board, there are going to be many number of brains from various specialties who are going to handle the case and very number of the options for treatment will be put forward and the best option will be chosen for the patient, which is going to be helping the patient for getting a better prognosis for the whole scenario. The management, when you talk about the management, there are only three options which are being given to the patient. Either surgery, surveillance, or expectant management. Expectant management, as Madam told very clearly, lesions which are going to be less than one centimeter, patient need not have any follow -up. But ideally, what we usually do or what I do in my center is those patients also we request them to come after a year for a repeat ultrasound or repeat scanning is to be done. When we talk about surgery, surgery, immediate thing, what many of us we think is why not we go ahead and aspirate this thing and why not we get a diagnosis of the whole thing. There's not so much of fluid there. It can be a medical fluid. Why not we aspirate? But studies have been done. Studies have very clearly shown that aspiration for a diagnostic purposes is not recommended. It's a level one evidence. Why? Because studies have shown the sensitivity of proving a case, whether it is a benign or malignant, following an aspiration of cystic fluid by cytological evaluation, the sensitivity is less than 25%. So it is not going to be useful for a patient's for, for the general diagnosis of patient by aspirating a fluid which is present in the cyst. Next, what is the uh, value of aspiration as a treatment? It is not recommended in any case. Even for a benign condition, it is not recommended because for about 25 to 40 percent of the cases, within one year, these lesions will recur. So it is not recommended even for benign condition. Uh, the aspiration is not a treatment of choice. Very important thing, what you need to understand, which will affect the patient in the problem prognosis, the longer the outlook of the patient will get affected is a spillage of the cystic content. Whether you think it is a very low risk case or an intermediate risk case or a high risk case, whatever the risk may be, the chances of the tumor getting spilled is going to be there. And that is going to definitely affect the prognosis and the outlook of the patient because the patient will need an additional treatment because you are upstaging the disease and you're going to give a worse prognosis for the patient. There is one exception. Where do you do go ahead and do an aspiration? 
in symptomatic patient, in a very elderly patient, patient is unfit for any surgical procedure. In order to alleviate the symptom of the elderly patient, you go ahead and aspirate. This is just a level two evidence. And very important thing is the discussion needs to be done with the patient and the attender or the caregiver that it can recur in any number of months or in the weeks, it can definitely recur. That needs to be informed to the patient. Now, the previous speakers have told about the surveillance. When do you go for surveillance? Surveillance is nothing but out of the keeping the patient under observation by repeated scans and repeating the CA125 or the tumor marker. Who are the patients who can be taken for surveillance? Surveillance can be usually done for patients for whom you think that RMI is less than 200 or whom you consider as a low risk for malignancy. Usually these are cases which are simple, unilateral, unilocalysis, which are less than five centimeter and they should have a normal CA125. When do you take this decision? The decision should be taken very clearly with the discussion of the patient and the attender and to assess the compliance of the patient, whether the patient will be fit enough to go through the whole thing. Because it's a long drawn process, the patient needs to come to the hospital repeatedly and they should have the logistics to go through the whole thing. And preferably at this point of time, a consent to be taken at this point of time, because we do face a lot of legal issues on this thing. So it needs to be taken with the consent. Why do we do all this surveillance? On what basis do we do? On what faith do we do? Because studies have been done, where it has shown, as Madam has told very clearly in the first talk, that cysts which are less than one centimeter, which do not have any changes, they need not be followed up. And simple cysts has been shown, and they've been on a very long follow up these the chances of malignancy developing on this simple cyst is less than five centimeters less than one percent so such cyst can be kept under follow-up and more than 50 percent of the simple cyst usually resolve within a period of three to six months so this is the concept of keeping the patients under surveillance because these have been done by some studies and the studies have very clearly shown that simple cysts which are less than five centimeter have a carrier risk of less than one person so they can be kept under follow-up. Up to what time do you follow up and what are the methodologies of keeping the patient under surveillance? How do you survive this patient? The surveillance can be done by repeated scanning. The scans can be done once in, uh, immediately after the initial scan, after six weeks, 12 weeks, after three months, once in three months for every year. At the same time, repeating a CA one for That is why I told you the compliance of the patient and we need to always discuss with the patient, what are we looking at? What are the changes you are looking at? And at, at what time will you stop the surveillance? All these things need to be discussed with the patient before you embark into this type of a management. When do you stop the surveillance? The surveillance can be stopped First, when we don't have any change in the cyst or there's no increase in the size. And many times what you see is a reduction in the size of the patient can, the cyst can resolve, the mask can resolve, that can also happen. And very clearly, there should be a normal CA125. If the CA125 is showing any trend of raising or if the CA125 is going to be changing in its value or increasing in its value, then it is not a case for surveillance. All these things should be discussed with the patient. Sometimes what happens is the patient does not want surveillance, patient wants to have a surgical intervention. So uh, are there any ideal methodology for frequency of scanning? I told you there is no method which is identified. But what we routinely do is even after follow up one year, we request the patients to come after one year for repeat scans to be on the safer side. That is also prescribed with that of the RCOG. When do you uh, interfere in the surveillance? When there is going to be a features suggestive of malignancy in that next cell mass, as was told by the previous speaker. If there is going to be an appearance of any metastatic disease like a nodule uh, or the woman to become any caking or any peritoneal deposits appear, then we need to stop the surveillance. As I told you, if it is going to be a raising trend or a change or elevation that of CA125 also, we need to stop. And the patient's view is also very important. Some of the patients do not want any surveillance for such patients also. We need to do some intervention. What is the best, best surgical approach? As, as was informed by our previous first speaker, a methodology can be either laparoscopy or by that of a laparotomy. Obviously, it all depends on the level of suspicion of the nexal mass. If the level of suspicion or the degree is going to be more towards the malignancy, it is preferable as of today to do a laparotomy. If the uh, thing is very low, then it is a laparoscopy. 
both the condition whether it's being a laparotomy or a laparoscopy spillage of the content should be avoided because as i told you initially the spillage can alter the prognosis of the patient when you're doing considering laparoscopy it is for patients who have an rma of less than 200 and if they are considered as a low risk case then you go for that and it also depends on the surgeon it's a surgeon factor plays a very important role because the surgeon needs to be experienced to in order to handle such cases because there are a lot of other intrinsic things which are and which are needed when you are handling a large cyst inside the tummy if the patient is not suited for conservative management but still the case is of a low risk case then also you can consider these cases for a laparoscopy what are the ideal things which you do in a laparoscopy the, the thing what you need to do is a bilateral salping oophorectomy but the most important caveat of the whole thing is not to spill the content and the whole thing is to be taken in a retrieval bag preferable to take by that of the umbilical port or uh, by if you are very well versed with that of the vaginal route you can also be because studies have shown that patients uh, they can be uh, if they are going to be handled by that of the umbilical port it has a better uh, quality of life for the patient the chance of hernia is low the chances of any injury to the epigastric vessels and the chances of pain all these things are less if the patients are handled by that of the umbilical the best is by that of the vaginal route but it needs a lot of uh, technical demanding things will be there so if you're able to do or uh, retrieve the specimen through the vagina it's the best thing when you're doing a laparoscopy it is always important to get a consent for that of the opening open methodology also and if there are any findings during the laparoscopy which show that it can be towards that of malignancy then we need to always open and do the full staging which is necessary for that of the malignancy in high risk cases, this is catching up very fast in a laparoscopy. In high risk cases also, there is a low role for laparoscopy for diagnostic purposes in order to take some biopsies from the nodules and other things where you suspect a high risk case, you just do a biopsy for these patients by doing laparoscopy and for assessing the operability and for estimating the peritoneal carcinomatous index in advanced cases. What do we mean by that? It is very important for the patients to complete Resect. As of today, optimum debulking has become complete cyto reduction. That is the best you can offer for the patient. Initial days, it was one centimeter, then it became 0.5 centimeter. Now it is CC0. You should be able to completely cyto reduce. There should not be any macroscopic disease left behind at the time of the surgery. That is the most important thing which we try to achieve during the time of surgery or all these malignant cases. And these patients can also go through laparoscopic hypec is also being done nowadays. And those so laparoscopy has a role in these cases. A word of caution among all these laparoscopic things is what we have seen in our personal experiences. Patient can have port side nodules. So what we do in certain cases, during the time of high risk laparoscopic procedures, if there are a lot of peritoneal deposits and if it's a high grade tumor, we find this peritoneal nodules to be coming up in these patients after a period of time. So we try to take off the port sites also during the time of the main surgery. Right. Minimal access surgery, as we all know, has its advantages. Like in laparoscopy, when you're doing for these malignant cases, the diaphragmatic surface, which is very difficult to approach, is very comfortable when we do by that of the laparoscopy. But it has its own pitfalls. Like when you are inter uh, loops, you know, the mesenteric area, when you want to see whether there are any deposits that can be easily missed if you're not careful while doing a laparoscopy. And at the same thing, the epigastric area, that is doing the uh, undersurface of the stomach, in the pancreatic area, the lesser curvature region, in the, in the uh, crust of the diaphragm, all these areas, which is the epigastric region, they can also be missed because these are the areas which can recur after a period of time, after one year or so, we'll have multiple nodules. So you, when you're doing these things, you need to keep in mind that these areas need to be assessed properly. But laparotomy is one thing which is usually prescribed for a high risk case or wherever you have a clinical suspicion, if the RMA is more than 200. And during the time of laparoscopy, as I told you, if there is a suspicion of lap malignancy, then you need to immediately open up or you do it as a secondary procedure. If during laparoscopy you have a histology, which is confirming that of malignancy also, then you go for a laparotomy. And the surgeon factor also plays an important role. If the surgeon is not capable of doing anything laparoscopically, then it's better to do it laparotomy. And if the, some of the patients, as you all know, some of the patients are very keen. They say, I don't want laparoscopy. In that case, we need to approach only by that of the laparotomy. So surgeon and the patient factor also plays an important role.
This is a very important thing, you know, this slide is a very important thing because we always have the mark of 10 centimeter. The 10 centimeter, if the said there is no study which has shown that the size matters with that of the malignancy. But traditionally, historically, if a lesion is more than that of 10 centimeter, we go in for surgical thing because the chances of malignancy is very high. As Madam, the previous speaker was talking about the uh, issues of the size, you know, what happens is if there is going to be a 10 centimeter, the, uh, the assessment by that of the radiology, by the ultrasound, or the transvaginal ultrasound, or the transabdominal ultrasound also becomes difficult. And it is always a chance of a miss is there. So the chances of malignancy in a large cyst is very high. So it is always better to remove off the large cyst lesion. If the size is between 5 to 10 centimeter, and if the patient present out to vague symptoms or the patient has risk factors, as I told you initially, with that of the yeah, ovarian risk factor syndrome, then the patient needs to be taken up for surgery. But if the lesion is less than 5 centimeter, but the patient is keen on removal and the patient should have the concern that they are accepting the morbidity and mortality of the surgical procedure, then the patient can be taken up for the surgery if it is even less than 5 centimeter. Laparotomy is very important. It's a separate topic on its own, but I'm just going to tell you what is important. Never go for a transverse incision. Please, it should be always a midline incision because if by chance, if you're going to convert the case into that of the main procedure, we will be putting an incision from the ZIFI to the pubis and it will be a definitely a midline incision because if you're going to give a transverse incision, it becomes too scarce for the patient. To avoid that, it's always preferable for approaching. It will be better if it's a midline incision. Same way, when you're doing the laparotomy, a complete exploration and documentation where all the disease deposits is there is very important. The only target as an oncologist, what we will have at the end of the surgical procedure, there should be no macroscopic disease left behind the tummy. Everything needs to be taken off. And the only caveat, the only the disadvantage in the case where we will not be able to proceed with the surgery or where we will not be able to achieve SCC0 will be if there are multiple deposits in the small bubble serosa. If it is started with it, that is the only case where we will not be able to achieve a complete cytoreduction. The rest of the anything, you know, we are able to achieve a complete cytoreduction. It has been very clearly shown that if the patient is going to have microscopic residual disease after deep working, the survival of those patients are poor when compared to patients who have achieved complete cytoreduction. There is a role for frozen section. It's a very important tool for a surgical oncologist or for a gynecologist, you know, and availability of a frozen section in the center also plays a very important role. And some of the patients, they don't want to take a decision on that. They want a paraffin section. And it's also to be discussed with the patient before we take a call on the whole thing. What we have seen in our own practice, you know, the, if we have a diagnosis of a benign case or an invasive cancer, the diagnosis many a time, 99% is correct. But if a reporting is that of a borderline tumor, we have seen one fifth of the cases, that is nearly about 20% of the cases, it can turn out to be that of invasive and it will be generally grade one and it will be an early stage disease. But what is a simple advice is when you are in doubt, take the whole thing in total, take the whole mass in total without rupturing the tumor. That is the most, in case you rupture, plenty of wash, at least 10 liters of wash with warm water is what is usually advocated so that we'll be able to make something out of the whole thing. In, in, if you're handing the postmenopausal, what I want the, the general gynecologist or our own friends to remember is the surgery or the intervention, it does not stop with only the surgical procedure. After that, there are chemotherapy which needs to be given for the patient so that we'll be able to achieve the whole good thing for the patient, the prognosis of the patient changes along with that of the chemotherapy, if the chemotherapy is given to these patients. So when we give a neo-adjuvant chemotherapy, NACT is given, and sometimes we give adjuvant chemotherapy also. So uh, 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 there is a uh, thing, if, the, if on evaluation, if you feel that the tumor is a larger in size, that you will not be able to debulk the whole tumor, then you subject the patient for neo-adjuvant chemotherapy. If you're able to achieve total cytoreduction, then you go in for a straight surgery and then subject the patient for chemotherapy. There are certain things which are coming up. When do we do a surgery after giving chemotherapy? At least after three cycles, you reassess and then go for surgery. There are certain things which are catching up now, which are called as the, yeah, this is the, yeah, uh, and there are some studies which are showing that patients who have gone through primary cytoreduction and who have gone through interval debulking surgery, the survival is the same on these patients. There is no difference in survival, but we need to, bottom line is in both the procedures, we should be able to achieve CC0. IP chemotherapy, intraperitoneal chemotherapy is catching up in a big way. 
it has been shown to improve the overall survival of patients. What I mean by this, we will keep chemo ports in the abdominal wall, wherein we'll be able to deliver chemotherapy directly into the abdomen because it's a trans mix spread. We want to address the peritoneal cavity. The next thing which is coming up in a big way is the hyper hyperthermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy, keeping chemotherapy at the temperature of 41 to 43 degrees inside the tummy so that the absorption by the peritoneal cavity is going to be more for chemotherapy and it will have a good results. This slide has already been discussed in the, uh, by the first speaker, Madam, myself, uh, already discussed this. But anyway, I'll try and uh, tell you again, in a postmenopausal patient with the ovarian cyst, if the cyst is more than one centimeter, we start treating the patient. If it is less than a centimeter, we don't generally want to treat the patient. But what I would tell is we like to have a scan done after a year's period. So along with that, we need to have the values of CA125 so that we'll be able to calculate the RMA. If the RMA is less than 200, we think that is a low risk for malignancy. If it is RMA is more than 200, it's a high risk for malignancy. If it is low risk for malignancy, we need to have two features, that is the size, whether it's less than five centimeter or more than five centimeter, whether it's symptomatic or asymptomatic. If it is asymptomatic, less than five centimeter, we can consider about following up the patient in conservative management or the surveillance thing, whatever I told you. If the patient has symptoms, then we need to interfere. If the patient has a non-simple, symptomatic, more than five centimeter, multilocular, bilateral, then they need to be considered by for a salpingo oophorectomy, usually bilateral after the consent of the patient's attender and the patient, right? What happens if it is going to be more than RMI of 200, then the patient needs to be having further investigation as told by our previous speaker in the form of a CT, MRI, a PET, whatever is evident in that particular time. Very important, very important. As I told you, multidisciplinary tumor board and by a specialist person, who is trained in treating those cases, if they're going to have the treatment by those people, the, uh, the end result, the prognosis of these patients is definitely better. So follow, how do you follow up these patients uh, after the whole treatment is completed? A periodic clinical examination is a must. The clinical examination should also include examining the breast also because these patients proper tummy examination, a pararectal examination for any rectal cancer or whether it was vaginal examination and abdomen and bilateral breast examination, FCA wanted phase of biological investment, whenever it's necessary, whenever in doubt, a radiological evaluation is also to be done. So a take home message is whenever you're handling a postmenopausal adnexal mass, handle with high level of suspicion for malignancy. Discuss whatever you do with the patient and then take a decision and tell them what is the end point, what you're expecting in each of these decision making. When the suspicion is high for a malignancy, the preferable thing is refer it to a higher center, which you'll always be appreciated by the patient. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ayappan, for your uh, uh, comprehensive and lucid talk. You have uh, nicely insisted uh, on the message that uh, ruling out malignancy is of uh, paramount importance in a postmenopausal woman with adnexal mass. And again, uh, stress has been laid on the proper history taking, personal as well as family. And of course, uh, we all understand that uh, surgery is the sheet anchor but there is a definite role for certain patients of surveillance and even expectant uh, management. And you have also nicely stressed upon uh, that uh, on the surgical target, uh, uh, that is complete cytoreduction. And uh, stressed again and again on the multidisciplinary tumor uh, board, which is very, very important. Thank you very much thank for you. your uh, excellent talk. Thank you. And I thank uh, on behalf of Dr. Vijayalakshmi and me, uh, Dr. Hepsiba again, for having given us an opportunity to chair this wonderful academic session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam. I would like to thank the chairpersons and also the speakers for that excellent session we have had. Uh, not even one of the delegates leaving the meeting. And we don't have any questions in the chat box. That is not okay.
<laughs> that means it's been very crystal clear. <laughs> there, there are two things, you know. No, no, One, the they have not understood or it. they are not uh, wanting to ask questions. Okay. No, no, no. It was very crystal very clear. clear. Very, very clear. Very clear. Thanks, thanks everyone. Now we would uh, move on to the quiz session. Quiz for the young gynecologist, young and mm -hmm. older life. Chitrakala, are we ready with the question? Now we have 12 questions and we have about 20 seconds uh, for each question and then it disappears and the next question flashes. There will be, uh, uh, you know, true or false that you can click on and then at the end of the panel, we will choose the winner who, who, uh, who gives all the correct answers. Not only that, it was also the fastest. And for the winner, we have a certificate uh, as well as a cash prize of 1000 rupees. So let's all begin with the first question. So I'll read it out with a normal CA125 for asymptomatic simple ovarian cysts in postmenopausal women. Conservative management is recommended if the size Okay, as they are casting their uh, answers, I think we are having the percentage of people who are choosing that particular answer. So I can see majority are going for the second choice. Okay, then we'll move on to the second question. Uh, risk malignancy index is calculated by what factors based on the ultrasound finding menopausal status into CA125? Ultrasound finding menopausal status into CA125. Okay, third question. Aspiration is not recommended for ovarian cysts in postmenopausal women in general. I would add that in general. Only 50% of the delegates have voted. I would encourage all of, the, all of you all to vote. We have the fourth question now. This is not a feature of malignant tumor according to IOTA simple rules. Irregular solid tumor, ascites, acoustic shadowing, at least four papillary projections, irregular multicystic lesion. Which one is not a feature for malignant tumor? Okay, fifth question. In a postmenopausal woman, malignancy is most strongly suspected when the lesion is unilocular, lesion is less than 10 centimeters, papillarities, normal CA125, asymmetrical vascular diameter. I think Dr. Sonal Panchal's talk was very crystal clear. Which is the most strongly predictive finding? Okay, sixth question. In the postmenopausal women with suspected ovarian malignancy, the most preferred primary investigative strategy should be. Keyword is primary investigating strategy, transvaginal scan, biochemical markers, transabdominal scan, all of the above. Seventh question, laparoscopic management is not appropriate for any ovarian cyst in a postmenopausal woman. True or false? Eighth question, 
Only 10% of ovarian cancers have an identifiable genetic mutation such as BRCA1 or 2. True or false? Okay, we go on to the next. Borderline ovarian tumors are primarily managed by surgery and respond poorly to chemotherapy. True or false? Tenth one, malignancy arising in an endometriotic cyst is usually a low-grade endometrioid or clear cell carcinoma. True or false? The last but one, what is HIPEC? Hyperthermia intraperitoneal chemotherapy. True or false? And the last question, what is CC0? Complete cytoreduction, is it true or false? Expansion for the abbreviation CC0. True or false? Okay, thanks Chitrakala for that smooth presentation of the quiz questions. We will uh, process the answers and we'll announce the winner at the end of the panel, which brings us to the very interesting session uh, now, to, which is the panel discussion on adnexal masses in postmenopausal women. Can we... So to moderate this panel, I invite uh, Dr. Anbukani Subayan, uh, called uh, uh, dear uh, Anbu by all of us. She is a fellow in gynae oncology and she's had European certification in gynae oncology. Currently, she's an uh, uh, oncologist with the, and a consultant gy a gynae oncologist and robotic surgeon in the Kobe Medical Center and Hospital Coimbatore. She is also the executive member of the Association of Gynae Oncologists of India. She has received fellowship from the Australian Society as well as from the uh, Portugal. So without taking much of your time, Anbu, can you please take over the session, the panel? Uh, thank you so much for having me here. First of all, uh, welcome to all my teachers because of who I am here. And I see so many on the screen and uh, uh, heartfelt gratitude, starting from Hatsiba Madam, uh, Tamil Chavi Ma'am, and of course, Shobna, who is there during my Masuji uh, training. I don't know if you remember. And last but not the least, uh, the panelist herself, Dr. Suma, who is my guru and teacher. And uh, I'm really, really humbled and honored to be here. I'm going to share my screen. Um, and uh, in the meanwhile, uh, can I please uh, have my panelists' uh, slides on? Chitrakala. Uh, first on my panel is uh, like my teacher, Dr. Suman Atrajan. She has uh, she has been uh, practicing uh, ever since I remember <laughs> for the last uh, so many many years, and she is my gynec obstetrician as well. Uh, she is uh, literally a super uh, woman. She now uh, is the HOD of uh, Ganga Hospital at 
Coimbatore, and previously she was uh, at uh, Cook Samin Island Memorial Hospital and uh, a DNB teacher and HOD. She also um, runs the SJ Craft Fertility Center. She has numerous, numerous awards, um, and she truly deserves each for one of them, not just for her uh, position as a teacher and as a gynecologist, but, but as a as a, a childlike uh, enthusiasm towards learning new things. And I, see, and I see that, and I really wish I could uh, emulate that as I grow older. So thank you so much for uh, uh, being on this panel, ma'am. Uh, I'm really uh, honored to have you. Uh, next is my colleague, uh, Dr. Kavita. I think we were contemporaries uh, while we were doing our PG. Uh, she is, uh, I'm, I'm glad to know she's the course director from, uh, uh, from IOG who's in charge of the Gynae Oncology Postdoctoral Fellowship Program. She is an MCH in Surgical Oncology, and she's done a fellowship in Gynae Oncology from Tata, Mumbai. Welcome, Kavita. I hope to learn a lot from you this evening. And last but not the least, another spectacular personality, Dr. Anita Ramesh. She's a medical oncologist, current professor and HOD from Savita Medical College. Her long list of achievements, both academically as well as uh, in the, um, uh, in the public service space is astonishing. She has uh, completed uh, her DM specialization from uh, Chennai and uh, she's done a remissy in oncology from UK, from Nottingham. And uh, she's been practicing for the, uh, as a pediatric and medical oncologist, not just in Sabita, but also from Apollo and uh, Kaveri Hospital. Thank you so much, Anita, for consenting to be on this panel. Uh, looking forward to having a, a a discussion with all of you. So can I please uh, uh, screen share? So the last three talks, which have been um, fabulous, um, makes our job easy. I don't think just the panelists, but everybody is going to be able to answer the questions because uh, you know these are, uh, can you see my screen? Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah. Yes, Andrew, yes. So this is just a, a synopsis of all the three fantastic talks that happened before us. And I hope that uh, uh, this, these uh, cases will help us put what the, uh, what the speakers have actually been saying. Because sometimes when we are sitting alone in our OPD and staring at this report, we are actually caught by self-doubt and we think, as is it safe to send this patient away? Uh, saying she can be followed up. Is it safe to do a laparoscopy? And these kind of doubts come to all of us day in and day out. And uh, that's why this panel, I guess. So the first case, I'm going to discuss two cases. The first case is a 65-year-old multi-paris woman who had attained menopause 25 years ago. And uh, she, like uh, Reti Ma'am pointed out, was for investigated for uh, UTI because she presented with complaints of hematuria and frequency and she was diagnosed to have a UTI and she underwent a routine ultrasound of her abdomen and pelvis. She came to see me because of bilateral adnexal cysts that were seen on, an, on her ultrasound scan. Um, her medical history, basically she had, uh, she was high risk medically because she had been in hypertensive for 25 years and she gave symptoms suggestive of coronary artery disease about two years back, but she had flatly refused an angiogram and she had been put on isosorbide and etinolol and her echocardiogram showed left ventricular uh, hypertrophy with a diastolic dysfunction of grade two. In my examination, I felt like she had abdominal adiposity and nothing else of significance. And in pelvic exam, there was a vague left adnexal fullness. Uh, her investigation showed that she had mild renal dysfunction, probably secondary to the, um, um, to the hypertension, long-standing hypertension. And this is what her ultrasound abdomen report that was done outside showed. She had a uterine fibroid, which was 3.1 centimeters largest dimension, and she had a well-defined, thin-walled, multi-loculated cystic lesion without any vascularity. It was bilateral, and the right-sided lesion was 3.3 centimeters, and the left was 3.2 centimeters longest dimension. And the CA125 was 11.6. Uh, and this was done about six to eight weeks before she met me. The history is not done yet. She had also been advised an MRI outside, which kind of correlated with the same findings, which showed a utri uterine intramural fibroid, which showed bilateral adnexal cysts, again confirming that these were a thin, uh, uh, they were small cysts less than five centimeters on both sides with thin internal septae and no solid areas, no free fluid. 
Now, my question is, whenever I see a patient, even because I'm in a tertiary center, the patient comes with two reports initially itself, you know, an ultrasound as well as an MRI. Is it really required in these cases? And what is the first recommended choice of imaging? I think that's the simplest question I can ask after all of these talks. Uh, Ma'am, would you like to take that question? Uh, yes. I think uh, they, uh, the previous speakers have already said that uh, transvaginal sonography is the only most important modality of imaging for uh, initial uh, assessment of any uh, tumors. The, uh, plus including the MR, uh, including the CA125. MRI should be used only later when you strongly suspect malignancy and you want to evaluate further about the malignant tumor, you need to have an MRI, not for the initial assessment. Yes. So um, this is uh, almost like, you know, a knee-jerk reaction that the minute you see an adnexal marsh, the patients go in for 3D imaging. And I think if you have training in ultrasound, what you need to focus on is kind of going back and revising on the guidelines that have been put forth by all the speakers that a transvaginal ultrasound is the first thing and what are the features that you really need to look at so you can give out because I know many gynecologists do their own ultrasound scans and when you report what are the things that you have to look for and report and whether that is enough and I think that's an important learning point for general gynecologists so that you don't uh, waste your time on unnecessary investigations I'm not saying it in this case but whenever it's required so we have strong evidence, and I'm not going to waste time on this. We know that TVS and CA125 is first uh, choice of investigation, and we have clear ultrasound categorizations, and it is our responsibility to know this if we are caregivers. So when do you advise a CT MRI? When do you want advice a CT, and when do you advise an MRI? Uh, Kavita, do you want to take that question? Yeah, so uh, see, basically, uh, generally, when you're talking in terms of an adnexal mass, if the suspicion of malignancy is high, no, by ultrasound, by ultrasound, if you have an irregular solid cystic mass or, you know, the suspicion of malignancy is high, if you have evidence of ascites or, you know, CA120 failure, no, definite malignant masses, then I would prefer to do a contrast CT because here, the, your, your, the aim of imaging is generally to detect the evidence of spread, the amount of spread of disease. Now, how much, whether you'll be able to do an optimal site reduction or not, or those are the things that come into your mind right now, when you know already by ultrasound that it, um, it is a malignant looking mass. The okay. MRI actually scores over your CT, especially when you have a benign suspicion. Like for example, you have a younger patient and you have endometriosis or, or dermoids or other things, tubo or an abscess, something like that. You know, benign conditions when they overlap, then MRI scores over. So those are the things that you really uh, where I would really like to know to characterize the mass, you know, when the patient comes to you with a localized uh, 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 adnexal mass. So, Absolutely. So Ango, this is can we put it this way that uh, uh, MRI could be used uh, because with the advanced technologies of MRI, they probably we could use it for every human who is below 40 years and uh, probably above 40 or 50 years, you should use more of a CT scan and a contrast CT. Can I that be done? Uh, I think uh, Dr. Kavita has been very clear, ma'am. So when you are uh, suspecting malignancy, say, for example, your RMI is more than 200 and you are anyway planning for a laparotomy or you're planning to refer this patient to a cancer center, you do not have to think of an MRI irrespective of her age. You just order for a CT abdomen, pelvis, thorax. In fact, if you want to see, look for upper abdominal disease or mental metastasis, subdiagrammatic deficits, and if you want to look at a minimal pleural effusion that is there, all of this is well picked up on a CT. It's a shorter time scan. It has, it's less expensive, although it has contrast uh, usage in it, which is, you know, brings about the, uh, the, the side effect of anaphylaxis and stuff, but still an MRI doesn't help much in upper abdominal imaging as much as CT does. So if you send a patient to me, you know, who's done an MRI pelvis, I will still have to do a CT abdomen to look at the upper abdomen like Dr. Kavita said. So I think it's not about age. I think it's about if it's malignancy and you're planning a laparotomy, you want to do a CT. If you do not know whether it's actually a malignancy, you're still not decided, you want to look at solid areas inside, you're not sure if it's endometriosis, you're not sure it's an abscess, then categorization further is helped by an MRI. So I think that is the difference. Okay. Okay. 
Um, Dr. Anita, would you like to add something to that? I do agree uh, with it. Yeah, uh, yes, MRI is a better uh, option at this point of time uh, because uh, we do not know uh, the um, operability of the mass. And again, this also brings into a question that uh, once we have a histopathology and if it is an advanced disease, then PET-CT also comes into the discussion, which rules out other abdominal sites of metastasis, does rule out pulmonary metastasis. So that comes into our, our discussion maybe a little later when we have characterized this adenoxal mass. But definitely at early stage, MRI uh, pelvis is also important. But I would also tell all the people out here that please do a CT scan, plain CT of the chest during the COVID era. Don't miss that. CT is definitely needed. And we have picked up many patients at this time, asymptomatic COVID. CT has florid pneumonia on both sides. So do a CT scan just along with the MRI. Absolutely. So CT, uh, pelvis, abdomen, along with thorax, especially now that COVID has become a part of our life. So uh, this slide just says that CT and MRI are not for first evaluation. And this basically puts into perspective that if you've already got malignancy on your plate and you want to assess disease spread, it is CT and MRI if it is an indeterminate mass and it needs further evaluation. So this lady had an MRI, like I already said, what next? What are we? What is the likelihood of malignancy with this sort of an MRI report? With the, uh, uh, can I have uh, uh, Kavita take that question? Yeah. See, this patient, I take it that she doesn't have any strong family history, or uh, she doesn't have. Yes, she doesn't she's have, sixty-five yeah. years old. Yeah. Just medically, yeah, coma. I mean, some yeah, comorbidities exactly. and uh, yeah. asymptomatic with this. Yeah. So this uh, obviously, this case, you know, uh, the risk of malignancy is quite low. So she will come into the low risk category. Uh, we need to talk uh, to the patient regarding, you know, as Dr. Ayapan actually pointed out, you have to talk to whether the patient will be. You have to assess the compliance of the patient as well. You know, this uh, four or five centimeters, less than five centimeters, even if it's bilateral, you could keep her under observation if you think the patient will definitely come for follow up. So it's important to counsel the patient well. Markers normal and no family history. And uh, so these are simple looking uh, cysts. Definitely, they can be kept under observation and make sure the patient comes to you on follow up. This has to be followed up till those cysts disappear. So that is what I'd like to keep it in mind. Now, even if they start de de decreasing in size, you know, uh, make sure you keep them under follow up till it becomes normal. So that is one thing that you have to do. So, so ma'am, uh, so ma what are the uh, uh, currently available tools that we can use apart no, from... I think we uh, need to do the malignancy index scoring, risk of uh, malignancy index scoring and the IOTA index models and the ORAT scoring. scoring. Uh, the, the risk of malignancy index scoring involves the ultrasound scoring plus the menopausal status and the CA125. So you look at these three points and then score. And if it is more than 200, it is uh, more of a malignancy. And then if it is less than 200, we'll have to again evaluate. Yeah. So uh, she actually met me about six weeks after she had done the initial scan. So I had an opportunity to actually follow her up and we did a TBS. And this is what the uh, cysts look like. Uh, like. Can, uh, can one of you comment on it? Ma'am, ma I know uh, you do your scans. So what would you think of this uh, image? See, this, uh, the, this looks more, this has a multiple small uh, separations in the uh, lower part of the cyst, but it is a clear uh, cyst. And uh, the other um, side, uh, the right adnax also shows the clear cyst, but it has a small separation. So it is bilateral involvement plus few septations here and there. No, and, is there a uh, suggestion of a papillae there? Would this be called a papillae? This, yeah. this kind of kept it's me all, a small solid area, yeah. yeah. yeah this, but um, uh, from Dr. Sonal's talk, I understand that if this goes into the iota, yeah, iota it becomes model, benign. Uh, anything that is less than 7 mm, mm. I guess, classifies as uh, you know, probably benign. But still, it had me worrying because it was multi-loculated. It was bilateral. So yeah. on the RMI, that itself is two markers, bilateral and multi-locular. Scoring of and, three. Uh, that goes into a score of three. But despite that, I had repeated her CA-125 and was 6.72. This is her fibroid. And uh, the RMI score is actually uh, 63. So, so from 11, it has come down to 6. Yeah, I mean, I think that's okay. That's just a lab to lab variation because probably two different labs. So that is not going to be considered as a fall. As long as there is no rise, I think she's safe. And uh, if you actually look at it very closely, she's 
shown a slight increase in her parameters. But the important thing uh, in her ultrasound parameters, but the important thing to remember here is these are sub five centimeter multiloculated cysts, possibly with a small papillary projection and, um, and with a CA125 CA that is normal with an RMI of less than 200. So uh, Kavita has already told, uh, told the uh, management options, conservative management, but I think Dr. Ayapan nailed it because a conservative management is easy to say in a panel or with the well-educated woman. But the majority of women who come to our uh, OPs, we know they are compliance and we really have to assess compliance, take consent and suggest conservative management. Quickly, can someone still uh, uh, tell me how to manage, how to follow up, and what is the intervals? Because I know Kavita, you said you like to follow it up. Till no, it uh, uh, I'd like to uh, see. Uh, uh, Anbu, just a second. Can I add on something? Yes. See, uh, the the initial ultrasound picture was just a multiloculated cystic lesion, but yes. when you repeated the scan, there was a papillary projection there, and I I am not happy about it. So whenever I have some some new you know findings coming up then um you know now you 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 are more in terms of a benign tumor probably no maybe it's not borderline yet but it is not a simple follicular cyst or something so i am a little worried right now frankly and uh, you know this patient um uh, i don't know maybe she'll end up in surgery a little later but uh yeah. see uh, 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 that papillary projection is not okay for me okay i take that into consideration uh, Suma, ma'am, what's your uh, take uh, on this? See, the 65-year-old lady with all these high risk factors, uh, multilocular, and then bilaterality is a concern. But then uh, what is important is uh, the motivation. If you look at the IOTA and Nexel scoring, the, the small projection that is there doesn't look very significant uh, um, by scan. But uh, uh, see, what is important is how you motivate your patient for a conservative management. See, unless uh, the patient accepts uh, your line of management, it is very difficult for us to convince them for a conservative management. Probably if she is willing to go for a conservative management, I would wait and repeat again the scan after four months and uh, repeat the CS 125 and see whether it has regressed or have we, whether we have any other new changes. Okay. If I find any new changes, probably I would go for surgery. Or if I find it regressed or remain unchanged, probably I would still wait for another four months. Okay. So the uh, thing is that the follow-up, uh, I wanted to know about the follow-up in case someone is brave enough to uh, offer conservative management. And the thing is that these three months, to uh, six months, nine months is arbitrary. If you have a doubt, if patient is not very keen on surgery, you want to bring them in sooner. Although guidelines says, three to six weeks and six to 12 weeks. And then three months later on, that is for cysts where your suspicion is not, you know, you're fairly clear that it's benign. So if you want to bring this patient back in after conservative management provided, she's, uh, she knows it and she wants it. She knows the risks and she wants it. You want to bring them back in six to uh, eight weeks for a follow-up scan. Now, Kavita, if you had to operate on her, what would be the mode of uh, uh, approach? What would be the surgical approach? See, um, Though I'm uh, talking in a panel on a menopause society, see, uh, <laughs> lucky for you, I mean, this case has a bilateral mass because otherwise, you know, you, you will have the question of whether you remove one over, you know, I would do a completion. See, uh, I, you could choose to do, lap do it laparoscopically. See, I'm not suspecting malignancy in this case. Basically, this is probably a benign serous cyst adenoma. The problem is even benign tumors, you know, you have a type one pathway and left alone for a longer period of time, you know, they could change it to borderline over a later period of time. So if we have to offer surgery, you, this patient could be a high risk for laparoscopy. If she gets fitness, then a laparoscopy would do. Uh, you could, you have to do a bilateral salping of ophrectomy and then uh, you discuss the modes with the patient. And if you, she consents for it, you could probably proceed with a hysterectomy as well. So that uh, would be the choice for this patient. Absolutely. So if there is any role for laparoscopy in ovarian masses, it's probably a patient like this, where you're fairly sure it's benign, but you still want to get it out because you don't want it progressing any further, or you don't want to take a risk from a medical legal point of view, or if the patient insists, then you can consider laparoscopy in these patients. But my, I completely agree with you. I mean, I'm very pro laparotomy, even if these are small tumors, because just in case they turn out to be malignant, I don't want to spill it. 
i don't want to like you know uh, have it uh, upgrade and then her required uh, chemotherapy so i'm very pro um, laparotomy as well but just as a, a take home message this is the one group of patients where you don't have obvious malignancy screaming out at you from the screen but you have something intermediate it's not completely a unilocular small simple cyst less than 5 cm where you're very sure of the risk of malignancy if it is somewhere in between you could offer laparoscopy so the um, this is the take home point that if it is simple you have to remember it is less than 1% the risk of malignancy is actually 0.3% that is recorded in many of the studies and this is like done in thousands of patients if it is less than 5 cm unilocular and all that we can safely follow up these patients but everyone else you kind of got to keep them on uh, follow up so we've already discussed this um laparoscopy again uh, i think dr ayapan has really made it clear that you have to be well trained you have to take proper consent and the bso is recommended but i think in india you would add on a hysterectomy which also makes the cyst uh, the cyst retrieval the ovary retrieval easier because you would slide it down the vagina and please please avoid uh, puncturing these because they can upgrade to malignancy so uh, this patient i actually have kept her on follow up i've asked her to come back after three months because i've seen her over to uh, uh to uh, I mean, six weeks and she's very very keen on not having any surgery she's the one who refused angioplasty so she says i don't want any surgery unless it's absolutely necessary but i did have a lot of doubts because like kavika i had a huge doubt about that papillary rejection there so i'm crossing my fingers so take home messages the first uh, uh, choice of investigation or evaluation is the tvus simple cyst please let's not operate on them let let us leave them alone if they are less than 5 cm in postmenopausal women if they comply with all these rules because the risk of malignancy in this cyst is virtually like zero complex cysts like the one i presented may have may be offered laparoscopy but following rules of laparoscopy is very 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 important now bring on the entire panel including dr anita to this case my second case is a 60 year old multiparous woman who had complaints of nausea occasional vomiting and early satiety and this has happened over the last two months she did not have any loss of weight and she was not emaciated she was a uh, normal bmi she was still able to eat liquids and solids there was no other bowel bladder complaints she was 7 years post menopausal she had a family history with a younger sister who had breast cancer at age 50 and passed away after 5 years of treatment and fighting the disease now um i know that screening for ovarian cancer is not recommended but there is a lot of discussion about red flag symptoms uh, for ovarian cancer in many guidelines Dr Anita can you please uh, let us know what symptoms and when to act on symptoms for ovarian cancer because i think the awareness is moving towards symptom identification rather than on screening uh, yes uh, as on today we don't have the proper recommendations for an ovarian cancer screening like how we have the breast and the cervical cancer okay because not have a pre malignant condition which you can pick up and then treat whereas we have it in breast we have it in cervix like you have the cin dysplasia his we have it in cervix we don't have that that's one of the reason it's a relatively intra abdominal organ for which again screening becomes a little difficult so this has and the ca125 is not a very reliable marker we have seen ovarian cancers with a normal ca125 uh, so these are some of the points which are against the ovarian cancer but coming into this particular case this particular case has a family history of cancer uh one of, i think the sister is also yes. having yes. now there is an international recommendation saying that if you have a family history of cancer which is either the first generation or any two second generation or any lady having an ovarian breast cancer below the age of 35 is under the purview of uh, familial cancer or breast ovarian cancer syndrome okay then the role of many other things comes into the discussion that is a little different discussion you need to do the braca testing BRCA one and two. You also you I'll come to that HRR later. I'll come to that later. Yeah, there's a, a yeah. But then, uh, if it is a family history, yes, definitely screening for ovarian cancer is needed. That's what I want to do. Uh, ovarian cancer screening again. Your transvaginal ultrasound for a smaller tumor. Okay, and CA one twenty five CT abdomen. There is no specific as such. now next point to what you ask whenever somebody develops these symptoms remember they it is advanced it's not an early ovarian cancer when you have a pain abdomen fullness there is problem in urination there is problem in passing motion 
think the mass is a little big enough to cause this. So all these are late symptoms. So that's the reason we miss early tumors of the ovarian cancer. And when all the points which you have rightly put up, they are usually beyond three. Three, C, and they go. So it's a little later signs, okay? Yes, you need to definitely do a scan at this point of time to see what's going on. Yeah. So it has a nice guidelines has actually come out with uh, uh, an alert saying if you have any woman above 50 years of age who has persistent abnormal distension, and you see many of these that you can uh, you can sometimes dismiss the dismiss them off saying they have gastrointestinal acute gastrointestinal problems or something like that, but if they have bloating, satiety, abdominal pain, or increased urinary frequency, and, and for some reason they also say if it occurs more more frequently, like say every two to three days in a month then you've got to suspect ovarian cancer. Anybody with new onset uh, in, uh, by either IBS over 50 years, because it almost never occurs after 50, it's, uh, onset is much earlier in the 20s and 30s. If they have IBS, then you've got to suspect ovarian cancer. Um, so coming back to our patient, uh, she had a, a normal general and breast examination. And on her abdominal examination, there was no ascites and there was very mild tenderness in the left iliac fossa. And in her gynae exam, I could just feel a vague mass in the left adnexa. Uh, I could feel a left adnexal mass about seven to eight centimeters in size. And there was no POD nodularity to suggest uh, there was stuff there. So uh, she had had, an, again, she had had an ultrasound outside and this uh, upus was normal. And there was uh, somewhat of a correlating left adnexal mass, which was eight by six centimeters with solid areas, with increased vascularity, with free fluid in the pelvis and her CA-125 was 3,500. So simply one word answer, what is the next investigation of choice? CT. Okay, CT scan yeah. of the abdomen. abdomen chest. <laughs> yes, yes, abdomen, chest, and, and uh, Again, <laughs> Again, one word is that, yes, in an advanced stage, PET CT scan is advised. Okay, we, can, we do not know with an advanced stage or local stage because yes. we do not know the omental seedlings and any of the peritoneal seedlings. Again, to keep in mind, yes, when a surgeon is operating, you better to have a PET CT to rule out extra abdominal meds, or it will also help you to give a clearance in surgery. So will this patient require definitely brain? not in stage one. Not in stage one, definitely, ma'am. Not in stage two, but maybe at that borderline. Anyhow, stage three, stage four, it's definitely an indication if PET is available. Yeah, it is an option between not in uh, one and two. Uh, a CT scan or a PET scan. And lots of people moving towards PET CT when uh, facilities are available, but it's still not available all over uh, uh, the state. There are uh, specific centers here and there. CT is more widely available. So the first choice of uh, investigation would be CT, but if it's available, definitely PET also adds on. I'm not going to linger on the uh, images on this. On the CT, basically we had um, uh, we had um, a unilocular solid lesion, um, eight by five centimeters, contrast enhancement was present. There was uh, minimal or mental fat stranding. There was nothing to suggest or mental nodularity. There's very minimal fluid in the pelvis. So it looked like this was a pelvic um, uh, disease and it was not an abdominal disease at this point. So Kavita, I want you to take me through staging laparotomy and uh, uh, who should do it first of all? You know, why should you get involved in a case like this? Yeah, obviously this points towards malignancy and it has to be opened up by, you know, someone an expert is in oncology, a gynae oncologist or a surgical oncologist, uh, because you need to go about all over the abdomen. It's not just the pelvis. So here, obviously the patient has to be, uh, you know, it's full anesthesia. It, usually we give them APGA and it is a midline laparotomy. This patients, you get a consent initially and uh, what we do is like on entering the abdomen we inspect the entire abdomen see look for disease everywhere you know the entire abdomen go in a clockwise directions look for evidence of extra ovarian disease and then obviously you if the mass is mobile and operable you take out the mass and we usually send it for frozen section and uh, then we uh, uh, and we would have got a consent uh, pre pre previously for hysterectomy or not so even if there is no evidence of extra ovarian disease uh, we just, uh, by the time frozen comes, we proceed on with a type 1 hysterectomy with BSO. And by the time we get a post-frozen report, you know what we are dealing with. And then you go ahead and do the other stages.
staging procedures. If there is evidence of disease, you know, anywhere it has to be deep bulk. Obviously, a staging becomes a primary cytoreduction. Otherwise, if there is no evidence of extra ovarian disease, you have to complete a type one hysterectomy DSO with uh, infra, at least an infracolicomentectomy with uh, peritoneal biopsies. You know, uh, and uh, the most important thing is to walk around the entire abdomen, look for even small diseases here and there. You know, you, this uh, these crevices, you know, in the hepatorenal pouch, and you know, uh, these are the areas where you can miss disease, yeah, miss every root of mesentery. Entry, yeah. And then you, you have to do a paraortic and a pelvic lymph node dissection. Absolutely. So, yeah. Are you done? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. So, if, so if, it, if it turns out to be a mucinous tumor, I would add an appendectomy as well. Appendectomy, yes. So, got it. So, basically, why I brought about this point again, it has been uh, 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 you know, focused on by all the speakers in this meet is that when you have a, an oncological, oncologist involved, it actually improves the patient's survival. And that's, this has been shown in many, many studies. This is actually a, metastat, a systematic uh, a review meta-analysis of 18 studies, which has shown that when a patient is operated by a gynecological oncologist, the median survival, and that's the median survival, okay? It, it goes on, it increases by 69 months. And even if you have disease that is only in the pelvis, your uh, uh, outcome is also still better because like Kavita said, if she finds a malignancy on a frozen, she knows what to do next. She will do a paraiotic and a pelvic lymphadenectomy completely. She'll do a total lumentectomy probably and she will go into all the crevices inside the abdomen and take systematic biopsies and do an abdominal survey. And people are trained to do this and that is why it has been shown that even in a stage one patient that looks like it's in the ovary, it gets upgraded to 30% of the times it gets upstaged into a different, into stage two or three. And uh, therefore, it's important, uh, timely referral is life-saving for many of these patients. And uh, I'm just, uh, this has already been dealt with. This is just a good slide. This has just got released um, in, uh, in 2021, which talks about um, when a staging laparotomy is done thoroughly, what is the percentage of disease you find outside the ovary uh, even if disease, it looks like disease is only in the ovary. And these are all the sites, like even if it is only in the ovary, you know, it can get upgraded in all these areas, uh, in the omentum, in peritoneum, in paraiotic lymph nodes, pelvic lymph nodes, in uh, appendix and in cytology many, many times. Therefore, these are crucial steps in the staging laparotomy, even if it appears stage one. And it cannot be emphasized anymore. It's an important take home message. So involving the right specialist is very important and um, getting their help is very important. So we did the same thing. We did a staging laparotomy. There's mild ascites. It looked like mucinous fluid and there was an adnexal mass with a fibrous solid surface. Uterus and right adnexa was normal. An intraop abdominal survey was normal. A frozen was sent. It came out as borderline. My question is, does it really require a frozen section? I mean, what are the indications really for arranging a frozen section? Because it's not available in many places. Only cancer centers have it. Smaller units which call in a surgical oncologist don't have it. So when do you actually uh, arrange for a frozen section, Kavita? Um, see, the thing is like when we have a suspicion of malignancy, uh, as you said, the, uh, the, the staging laparotomy will include entire paraiotic lymphadenectomy up to the renal vessels. Now, it is not an easy thing that you can have postoperative complications because of that. So I think you need to really know. Uh, I mean, if you're going to do it for a patient who's really indicated, it is fine. It is good. But see, if it, see, you can have, see, even if you have a complex mass like this, it can come out as benign or borderline, like your tumor was borderline. So it probably doesn't require a paraiotic lymph node dissection. So then you're going to do some things that are extra, which are not necessary for, for the patient. And you've got to add on to the morbidity for the patient. So ideally, uh, so you, uh, I think that you need to have a frozen section, especially in these kind of patients, in patients who are, you know, you, you have a suspicion of malignancy. If you were going to do ahead, all the staging procedures. So, but then if, if you're planning for a primary cytoreduction, then, then uh, I, th I think it's it's okay if you don't have it. Yeah. So for, borderline tumors, uh, for borderline tumors, for uh, borderline tumors, I think the frozen section is not really helpful. Absolutely, ma'am. That's, uh, right. That's the point I want to make next because this is a borderline mucinous tumor. If it is, uh, if it is uh, benign, if it is malignant, uh, the report for, of frozen is ninety-seven to almost 
99%, some units 100% reliable. But in this particular uh, case, especially borderline mucinous tumor, the reliability of frozen section is only about 30 to 40%, which means that two out of three patients that you get a report in, you're going to have an upgradation in the final histopathology. So while you're ordering a frozen section, it's also important to know when the report comes back, how are you going to act on it? If it comes back as benign and if it looks benign, it's very important to also co correlate with your operative findings. If the rest of the abdomen pelvis is fine and the cyst looks fine and it comes back as benign on frozen, it's reliable. If it comes back as malignant, you know that you have to go ahead. Now, this group of borderline, especially mucinous tumors, they have coexisting areas of benign, borderline, and malignant uh, uh, tumors in the same cyst, and therefore they are not very reliable. So I went ahead with a complete staging because the mass didn't look, uh, I mean, it looked much more than a borderline tumor for me. And uh, um, our own publication has shown that this is a very dicey uh, area, borderline mucinous tumors. So we did a hysterectomy or mentectomy, lymph node dissection, peritoneal biopsies. And true enough, the post-operative histopathology upgraded to endometrioid adenocarcinoma. It was low grade with coexisting serous and mucinous borderline elements. And it was staged finally as a 1C3. So what is the next step, Anita? The, the, the ball is completely in your court. Yes. Um, okay. If you see uh, this, um, so it's a, again, it's, there's a family history as well. So it is stage 1,3C. 1,3C definitely uh, is an indication to 1A, 1B. Yes, we don't do anything. Yeah, 1C with the borderline component, low grade component, along with the, um, the family history. Yes, this is a definitely a candidate for adjuvant therapy. 1C I will give for adjuvant therapy. Uh, do you, and as in a, on to Pakli Carbo, do you have any difference of opinions about the chemosensitivity of these uh, tumors other than if they're not high grade? Yeah, as of now, yeah, high grade serous. Yeah, the uh, high grade steroids and the endometroid, yes, definitely there is a little bit of difference in the sensitivity, but still the guidelines are taxing and a platinum is the drug of choice. This tablet is the primary therapy for all ovarian tumors as on today. And you would go First with line. eight cycles, four cycles, six cycles, all six cycles? Six. Yeah, we do and we give three to four cycles to an assessment to see what going on inside and again continue six cycle is the standard of care uh, stage 1c6 should be enough we don't need to go up to eight and at the end of treatment uh, we do another repeat assessment to see what is the response at the end of uh, this thing so uh, this is uh, like right like dr anita rightly said the nccn says that we have to uh, give them uh, iv taxane carboplatin three to six cycles and what is the role of high tech because there's a lot of buzz in uh, for HIPEC, is there what is HIPEC and is there any role for this for this stage yeah. and uh, HIPEC is hypothermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy, and uh, the right now the level one evidence is actually available in the interval setting, the Vandrial's trial. So, uh, so actually the currently level one evidence for HIPEC is for advanced stage. Uh, CA ovaries, stage three and four. And after, you know, neoadjuvant chemotherapy, if you're doing an interval cytoreduction, you must have done a complete cytoreduction. Your CC score has to be zero or one. That means you have to leave behind less than 2.5 millimeters of deposits uh, anywhere within the abdomen. And if you're able to achieve that, then you can go ahead and give HIPEC for these uh, patients. For Can the other- repeat that once? Because it was brilliantly said, what is the indication for HIPEC? Just repeat that again. Yeah, so HIPEC is indicated right now, the, the evidence points towards uh, advanced stage epithelial ovarian cancers. So following neoadjuvant chemotherapy, you plan, you assess response after three cycles and then patient has responded well or static disease you, when, you, you can, when you're planning for an interval cytoreduction. So during interval side reduction, you do a debulking. So when you debulk the entire disease, and if you are able to achieve a CC0, which means no macroscopic 
residual disease left within the abdomen or pelvis or CC1, which means that less than 2.5 millimeters of disease left behind. If you're able to achieve that goal, then HYPEC has got a role. It has got a survival advantage for these women, but not in stage one or, uh, you know, uh, right now the, it is under trial. The ov HYPEC trial uh, two is recruiting. So we still do not have any um, uh, evidence for a primary setting, even in advanced primary setting, still we do not have any level one evidence. So uh, stage three, four, interval cytoreduction, optimal cytoreduction. These three are very important for HYPEC and it has a, it's, it's causing a lot of buzz, a lot more trials coming up. Uh, I'll finally end uh, with this question to Dr. Anita. What is the role of genetic testing in this patient? And what is the implication of genetic testing? How important it, is it for you in the therapeutic setting? Anita? Dr. Anita is muted. Yes, yes. Uh, what uh, now for the genetic testing? Definitely, this is a there's an indication as we have a, a, a tumor which is very there in the sister, and that is positive. We need to send the sample, particularly for genetic testing. Uh, we do the format, we do the germline mutation of BRCA1, BRCA2. There is also evidence to do the HRR testing, and uh, so uh, genetics germline mutation is that's what we do at this point of time. Now we have drugs available, there's a PARP inhibitors, but definitely it's not for discussion for this particular patient. It is approved in stage four where we use PARP inhibitors. Yes, so definite role of testing for all ovarian cancer patients is the current recommendation. My simple recommendation is at least send them to a genetic counselor, whether they actually take up genetic counselor, I mean genetic testing, um, we don't know, but just having a conversation with a trained person is very, very important. It's a bare minimum requirement because ovarian cancer patients now have an opportunity to get tested as well as get treated. But Dr. Anita rightly said not for this patient because it's stage one, but in advanced cases, we have molecules available now that can uh, change their survival rates. And this is, again, a huge buzz in the ovarian cancer treatment space. So this patient was offered six cycles of genet paclitaxel and uh, uh, carboplatin. She did not undergo genetic testing. She refused, and she's currently on follow-up. Uh, uh, she's completed about six months of follow-up. So my take-home messages from this case is that if you have a strong suspicion, please, please refer for a, a specialist treatment in a cancer center, and the treatment for early-stage disease is laparotomy with a good staging, and up upstaging can occur significantly, even if tumor appears confined to ovary. Uh, with that, I would like to thank the organizers for this brilliant opportunity and to all my panelists. Thank you so much. And Can I, I ask I, you one I, question? You. Yes, yes, ma'am. Um, see, these patients, uh, suppose there is a family history of BRCA1, BRCA2, severe can breast cancers or ovarian cancer. And she comes to you without any complaints and asks whether she can uh, remove her ovaries. What would you advise her? If the patient has herself undergone BRCA testing and she's carrying BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutations, okay. she is offered risk-reducing surgeries. The recommendation for BRCA1 mutation is to have surgery between 35 to 40 years and BRCA2 between 40 to 45 years because they present slightly later or 10 years prior to the cancer recurrence in her family member whichever comes earlier. Like if my sister had it at 35, I need to consider like serious uh, interventions around 25. That's the recommendation. We don't wait till she's 40. And uh, mastectomy again, at, as early as possible, but the uptake for risk reducing mastectomy is really low. Maybe Kavita can throw some light on that. What's the role of HRT if you have removed uh, ovaries at such an early age? You can give HRT because the whole idea of giving HRT is that the doses, the physiological dose that reaches the patient's circulation is much, much lower in HRT compared to your naturally occurring estrogen and progesterone. And therefore, up to normal age of menopause, which is 45, natural age of menopause, it's okay to give HRT. Estrogen, if hysterectomy is being done, if only risk-producing sulfingofrectomy is done, then you need to protect them with myrina. So far, the evidence with using Mirena and the risk of breast cancer is very patchy, but the risk outweighs, I mean, the benefits part outweigh the risk at this point in time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. I have been quite uh, uh, speechless about after this, listening to this panel, really, Anwar, that, uh, that was a brilliant uh, 
conduct of a panel and thanks to all the panelists for responding and giving such clear messages uh, but i have to say we have come to the end of the session uh, we'll announce the winners for the quiz we have six people who have answered and i would like to announce uh, the top 3 uh, people who have an, uh, who have answered 10 out of the 12 questions correctly and these are dr amrita valli raj mohan from madurai dr tilaka shri from chennai and dr kavita ranjit from chennai if you look at the time taken for answering i think dr amrita valli is the clear winner clearly 116 seconds and the next best is 174 and the third is 178 seconds these are the cumulative uh, time taken to answer all the questions together so we have an, we have said earlier that we'll announce the prize for the, the one who will answer the maximum number of correct questions and fastest uh, so that means the winner for today's quiz is dr amrita valli raj mohan from madurai congratulations this is the certificate that will reach you as well as a cash prize yes thank you so that uh, brings us to the end of today evening's program a very well conducted program we all learned so many important academic and clinical points uh, so i would like to request dr deepa tangamani uh, who uh, is a dynamic member of our society to propose the vote of thanks and conclude the session thank you uh, thanks dr shobhana it is my privilege to deliver vote of thanks for this healthy aging third series at the outset i profoundly uh, professor e hemantraj and professor begum rokia and dr from bangladesh for the and addressing the gatherings it's my pleasure to thank uh, the speakers who made this mind blowing scientific session devithi janigiraman dr sonal panchal and dr uh, s i f n and also thank our chairpersons who lead the scientific sessions dr shanti gunasing and dr vijay lakshmi sheshatri and it is an uh, i extend my thanks for the excellent panel moderated by dr anbu super or uh, anbu super anbu kani superan and the expert panelist dr suman atrajan dr kavita sukumar and dr anita ramesh i extend my thanks to our beloved president dr hepsiba for her uh, uh, the third continuous series of this uh, uh, last three months and our secretary dr tamil selvi chennai menopausal society and uh, today's master of ceremony dr shobhana mahadevan who made this uh, whole meeting uh, uh, continuously Uh, for uh, uh, continuously mastering the ceremony nevertheless i extend my thanks to all the delegates who attended the cme and also the virtual platform supporters shield pharmaceuticals and their team members who made this meeting successful and also congratulations to the space winner thank you one and thank you one and all thank you thank you ma'am thank you i'm sorry to interrupt uh, it's not right to say anything after the vote of thanks but i saw in the chat box uh, uh, we haven't given the right answers so is chitrakala are you ready with the right answers cpt ma yes ma'am shall i go ahead ma'am yeah yeah I think you can. Second question, you can go over it quickly. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Very fast. Yeah, seven. Eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 
the last one. Thank you. Thanks, Chitrakula. So we would like to now end the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Shobhna. Thanks, 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 Thank you, ma'am. Thank, Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much, ma'am. It was wonderful. Thank you, Thank you, ma'am. Always lovely things, ma'am. Thank you, 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 ma'am.